Hello and welcome to this November 28th International Investigative Commission on Truth in Elections, sponsored by the Schiller Institute. My name is Jason Ross and I'll be moderating this event. We are streaming live on YouTube and we have participants on Zoom. If you are on Zoom and are not hearing this in the language you would prefer, please use the translation ability by clicking the icon at the bottom of the screen. Although Election Day in the United States was November 3rd, Today, nearly a whole month later, that election continues. The election has not concluded. Although Biden was declared the president-elect, first by the media and then by a number of states who had certified their electoral results, the Trump campaign maintains that fraud occurred at multiple levels of the voting and counting process and otherwise, and they're seeking redress through investigations, audits of votes, recounts, judicial filings, and even action by state legislatures directly. For example, just this week, on Wednesday, members of the Pennsylvania legislature held a hearing in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, to hear from witnesses who documented the fraud and election improprieties that they had witnessed. On Wednesday night, Sidney Powell and her colleagues announced lawsuits that they were filing in both Georgia and Michigan, with numerous affidavits documenting irregularities at all levels of the voting and counting process, as well as testimony from expert witnesses to the number of ballots or votes that were called into question, making the case that this was of a sufficient level to change the outcome of the election or certainly to place it in doubt. Then on Friday, State Senator Doug Mastriano from Pennsylvania announced that he and his colleagues, both in the Senate and the House, were introducing legislation for a, a joint resolution of the Pennsylvania State House and Senate to decertify the election results and take back the authority that they claim under the U.S. Constitution for the state legislatures to determine the manner of appointing that state's electors to the Electoral College. We're going to be hearing about the basis behind these claims, about the opportunities for relief provided by these various efforts, and we're going to be doing that through witnesses and through a panel of legal experts who will be weighing in on this. I'm going to introduce now our panel of international jurists who will be hearing testimony from our witnesses. Following the witnesses' remarks, there'll be Q&A with our panelists, and then time for questions from the media, a little bit of time for that. And we'll then hear the thoughts and reflections from our legal panelists who we see here. So starting, uh, we'll go counterclockwise, starting on the lower left is Simone Levy. He earned his doctorate degree in law from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, the UNAM, and a master of law degrees from China, a first for a Mexican national at Redmond University. He was appointed an Undersecretary of Tourism in the Government of Mexico from December 2018 through May 2019 by President Andres Manuel López Obrador. Prior to this, he was the CEO of the Investment and Development Agency of the Mexican Government, and he was recognized as a young global leader of the World Economic Forum in 2013. He founded the China-Mexico Lecture and Fellowship at the UNAM and has conducted postdoctoral studies at Yale, Lee Kuan Yew Public Management School, and the John F. Kennedy School of Harvard University. We welcome him. Um, continuing counterclockwise, we have Marino El Savif, who from the Dominican Republic. Um, he is an attorney at law with 41 years of experience, including as attorney of the state of the Dominican Republic against crimes of corruption from 2000 through 2004. He is a professor of constitutional law and criminal law, as well as criminal proceedings. He received his master's degree in criminal law in 1992 from the Autonomous University of Santo Domingo, and he is a member of the Institute of Criminology at that university. He has been associated with the Schiller Institute and the thinking of Lyndon LaRouche going back to 1985, and he participated in the 1995 Martin Luther King International Tribunal. In 1974, he graduated from the Association of Christian Youth in Montevideo, Uruguay, with a degree in social work. He currently hosts a radio show and writes for various uh, Dominican media. Welcome. Uh, finally, in the upper right, we have David Meiswinkel, a United States Army veteran 
a former police officer and a criminal defense attorney in New Jersey, where he overturned a primary election based on voter fraud. He is a 9-11 activist and the current president of the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. He's very active in this sense. He is participating in this conference in his capacity as David Meiswinkle, attorney at law. So we thank our panelists for appearing, and uh, we will be looking forward to hearing their reflections on the testimony that we hear. There is another panelist that we will be, will be joining us later, and I'll introduce him when he joins us. So on to our witnesses. Our three main witnesses are Bill Binney, a multi-decade veteran of the National Security Agency, uh, the Schiller Institute's Harley Schlanger, and former Virginia State Senator Marine and retired Army Colonel Richard Black. We will be hearing first from Bill Binney, who is famous as a whistleblower who left the NSA in light of its violation of constitutional protections uh, afforded to people. Let's, uh, we will hear from Bill Binney in a recorded video, and he will then be available for questions from our panelists. So, Bill Binney. Uh, my name is Bill Binney, and I'm happy to, uh, to address the International Investigative Commission on uh, Voting Truth. And uh, my background, just to give you a little idea of where I came from, I worked for NSA for 36 years total, uh, four in the Army and 32 in a civilian. And I broke cyber's codes and data systems uh, in, against Soviet Union and different military targets. Uh, and uh, I basically also set up the, the uh, programs that made it possible for them to spy on the entire planet, and they're currently still using those programs. I can see them in the Edward Snowden material. They didn't even change the names. Mm. So um, it, it's very clear to me back then in, in September or mid-October of 2001 that the, the NSA started spying on every U.S. citizen in the country, taking in everything, content, metadata, you name it, uh, you know, voicemail, uh, voice over IP, uh, phone, the regular public switch telephone network, the internet, all these, all the short messaging searches and whatever people did on the internet, they were taking it all in. And by that time, I, I could not be a part of that. I, it was a direct violation of the constitutional rights of the first, fourth, fifth, and sixth amendments of the Constitution of the United States. And I could not be a party to that. And so I, left NSA and started to blow the whistle on it down in, uh, in this House Intelligence Committee. And then I attempted also to get to see the Chief Justice Rehnquist of the Supreme Court. That didn't go anywhere. And, and since the leaders of the House Intelligence Committee, Lynn, uh, Nancy Pelosi and, and Goss, Porter Goss, they had already agreed to all these programs in October of that year. So they already were a part of this. So they knew that Spying on U.S. citizens, all of them were going on. That was going on at NSA, and they agreed to it. Um, and so, from that point on, I just had to leave. So I left NSA basically in at the end of October, Halloween Day, two thousand and one. Initially, I started questioning Russiagate in August of 2016 when they first started talking about it. And it was more the sense of how they were talking about it it gave me the clear impression that they had no fundamental evidence to prove anything they were saying. And that came from NSA and so on. And later on in January of uh, 2017, when they issued the, uh, the uh, intelligence community assessment, which was really three agencies, not the intelligence community, uh, and selected analysts out of those three agencies, uh, it was clear then from that that they didn't have any evidence. Again, they said they, they had strong, they had, strong belief that Russia did the hack, but in the, uh, they had uh, strong confidence. And the way they read later on in the 13th page, I think, of, the, of that article, it said, uh, uh, here's how you can understand what we mean by high confidence. They said, that is not to necessarily mean we have proof to say something is true. Well, I mean, they even negated their own report there. And in fact, later on, you find out they didn't have anything. Even at that time, this was, this was when the uh, CEO of, uh, of uh, CrowdStrike was testifying to the House Intelligence Committee, you know, uh, Schiff's committee. <coughs> and uh, he was saying, uh, testifying to them under oath, that he could not show, he said the data, uh, the DNC data looked like it was prepared to be exfiltrated, 
but they never saw it being exfiltrated. Now, from all the forensics that we did of that, we looked at the, the, the where we had access to it was when WikiLeaks published it. So when WikiLeaks published it, we looked at the that data, uh, it was like five or six of us from the uh, BIPs, Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity here in the United States, and some, some uh, uh, people who were helping us over in the UK. And uh, we all started looking at this stuff, and they said, hey, uh, look at this emails here from the DNC. All of them have that last modified time ending in an even second. Well, that was 35,813 emails. All of them had the last modified time ending in an even second. That means a computer program did this. And the program that does that is the FAT file transfer, FAT file allocation table transfer. When you transfer data from one computer to a thumb drive or a CD-ROM or some memory stick, why that modifies that time because it has a, rounds off as an accuracy of uh, uh, two seconds. That, so it ends up in an even seconds all the way. So that tells you that this was downloaded, not hacked. The DNC emails were not hacked. They were downloaded to a storage device and then transported physically before WikiLeaks could post them. This fundamentally agrees with what Julian Assange was basically asserting without really saying that it was an inside leak. And also what Craig Murray, a former ambassador to, the, to the, Uzbekistan for the UK, he met somebody on the American University campus in Washington, D.C., who was involved in the transfer of data to WikiLeaks. And this is also what Kim.com said about assisting uh, people getting data to WikiLeaks. And all of this evidence pointed to that. that it was all a, a local uh, download, in other words, an inside leak, and that uh, it was not hacked. And so blaming the Russians was a diversion and a fake and a lie, and they knew it. Yeah, the, uh, for, for our elections here in the United States, using these uh, devices without having a check on the source code and the functionality of that source code is really, is really uh, 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 dereliction of duty. They should never have allowed that and they should never have bought that unless they could verify and validate the source code of executable that's going on in the executable that's, of that, those devices. Uh, and that goes back to a fellow, uh, Harry Hertzey, who uh, was another uh, st security person, a security cybersecurity guy, and he did a test on those devices in 2005. And he was able to, with one hack to, and I think Dennis will be putting up the article or portions of it so that people can see it and read it and, and go look at the whole article themselves and do some research on it if they want. But, but in 2005, he was able to prove that he could change both the central tabulation of uh, votes and the voting machine results tapes coming out. So locally and, and centrally, they would only see the, revotes, the, the results that that device was programmed to do. And that's where I was talking about, they call these kinds of things glitches. Well, they're not glitches. I mean, software does exactly what you tell it to do. If you tell it to change something from one to another, it does that. If you have a, a problem in your software, we call it a bug, and you have to get rid of the bug so that it performs properly, but whatever the bug is, it does it universally all the time. So it messes up all the time. So you can see it in your, in your data dump, and that's how you go through trying to figure out where the bug is and resolve it. But uh, having something that changes some votes and not all votes, that is not a bug. That's intentional programming. That's, that's, that's built into the software. And in order to ensure none of that kind of thing can happen, you need to be able to look at the source code running on that device to make sure it's doing what it says it does and it's proper for it to do. We sent out letters to every state, uh, Secretary of State of every state in the union, all 50 plus uh, Guam, uh, Puerto Rico, and I think two other places. There were a total of 54 registered letters we sent out to them saying we had a, we had a way that we'd like to help you all fix the voting system, fix to verify and validate the voting process in the United States, in your states and around the, the country. So, uh, and that we were quite willing to talk to anybody about it. We weren't holding anything as proprietary or anything. We were simply going to expose to them the thinking that we had that would give them some degree of certainty uh, of uh, reliability and accuracy and uh, confidence in the, in the voting process. And from that letter, we heard from no one 
absolutely no one responded. So that told me nobody wants to change the existing system. And nobody wants to do any of that. So, but we had, a, <clears throat> we had a proposal where we were talking about looking at things like the census, social security, you know, the voting registration, uh, the, uh, the public switch uh, telephone network system and all the phone numbers and addresses and names and all around the country in every, in every state and uh, doing basically a normalization of that, pulling it all together to verify and validate who lives where, their names, their addresses, phone numbers, whatever data we could assemble from the publicly available systems, whether or not they're alive or dead, you know, all that from the dead registry of Social Security, um, then we would have that as a master record for the entire country, and then be able to parcel out the valid voters or reliable citizens who are eligible to vote, to every polling station in the country. No matter how many that is, it doesn't matter. We know where they are physically, so we can assemble by location where the, red, where the legal voters are. And we wanted to do that and have it. Also, we wanted to put it online so it could do things. As people came into the polling station and registered to vote, it would check them on the, on the central list in the country so that they couldn't go from one polling station to another and try to vote again or one state to another and try to vote again. <clears throat> because once it was registered, it was registered. That was what we were trying to do to validate and verify uh, the voting system in the United States. We also were looking at ways and means that the individual citizens could validate that the vote that was cast by them was in fact the vote that was registered and counted centrally you know, for them and their record. So we'd have a way to do that with privacy built in. But, uh, so when it comes to uh, whistleblowers and leaks of information, um, the one thing that everybody's forgetting, including the Department of Justice conveniently because they don't want to remember this, also true of the intelligence community, all of these agencies and all the heads of these agencies don't want the public to know that the regulations governing classification of material uh, prohibit classifying evidence of crimes. And that's called Executive Order 13526, Section 1.7. It lists out, anybody can go look at this on the web. Executive Order 13526, Section 1.7. This is the order governing classification for the entire United States government. And it, this is what everybody's supposed to conform to when they're classifying material. Well, Section 1.7 says you cannot classify, maintain classified, or not declassify any evidence of a crime, corruption, fraud, waste, abuse, and so on, a few other things. You can go read the whole thing there, but those are the main ones. And so, but a lot of what Snowden and others have uh, blown the whistle on is evidence of a crime. So by their regulations, they must declassify. That's why I sent a note in trying to get at the bar that for the guy he was uh, uh, tapping to do, uh, to do his declassification of stuff, I said, all you have to do is look at that regulation and follow it. It's pretty simple. Um, any, any evidence of falsifying evidence for a, for a court, like in the FISA court, whether against the Russians or against anybody else, General Flynn or, or Roger Stone or anybody else in the country, that's the regulation that governs whether or not they can even claim classification. I mean, by, by law, by that regulation, they are required to declassify. So they can't hide behind national security or hide their crimes behind national security. And that's what they've been doing. And the courts have been letting them get away with it. They wouldn't even let my testimony into the court, into the court for uh, General Flynn or, or Roger Stone because they didn't want to hear the truth. I mean, the truth was so clear and obvious. They didn't want to hear about the hacking. They didn't want to hear about the executive orders. They didn't want to hear about the truth. And that's what's going on, you know, we're, we're using the Russia thing like, like the Nazis did the Special Order 48 and the Reichstag fire in 1933 to take over the country. That's exactly what they did. And in fact, if you, if you read the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, Section 1021, it says exactly what Special Order 48 says. It talks about having the ability to incarcerate anyone as long as the, you know, the, the uh, authorities that deem them to be a, a threat. And so all you do is incarcerate them indefinitely with no due process. And that's exactly what the NDAA Section 1021 says. 
And that's exactly what Special Order 48 said. So this, my, my friends, we are becoming the banana of a banana republic. Well, thank you very much, Bill Binney. I want to let our viewers know that uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Binney referred to, uh, Harry Hursty's research on the ability to electronically change votes, this exhibit is uh, among those filed in the, the Georgia case, and it's available on the, our website for this conference, so you can see it there. Uh, we're now going to offer an opportunity for our panelists to pose questions to Mr. Binney. And I believe that we are now, yes, we are now joined. I will we'll introduce our final panelist who got on, um, who we have connected now. On the bottom of your screen is Juan Francisco Soto. Welcome. Uh, Juan Francisco Soto is a constitutional attorney, having taught constitutional law at the University of Buenos Aires and Avellaneda National University. He was an election monitor in the Argentine elections of 2013. 2015, 2017, and 2019. He teaches courses on constitutional law and other training seminars at the Arturo Enrique Sampe Institute and the Argentine Association for Constitutional Justice. He's a founding member of the Law Institute on Foreign Debt, of the International Public Law Institute, and of the Federal Capital Chapter of the Public Association of Lawyers. He currently serves as legal counsel to the Paraguayan Argentinian Yacireta binational entity uh, regarding that dam that uh, spreads between the two countries. Welcome. So I'd like to um, open it up now to any panelists can go right ahead if you have a question for Mr. Binney about his uh, about what he testified to. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Simon Levy. Thank you, Mr. Bini. Good morning from uh, Ma Mexico City. Uh, I have uh, two questions for you. Um, considering the information that you have shared with us, I would like to ask you if you believe or you have any kind of uh, objective element that the pandemic situation right now in the USA affected directly in the way or the patterns of uh, two main sources of the votes of the ballots. The one is the uh, direct ballot, people that they went directly on the, on, the, on the election day, and the mail ballots. Do you think that there is a, like an objective uh, pattern or any material that you can share with us that affected directly to the to the result of the election? This is my first question. Uh, well, I certainly do think that the pandemic was used as a way of uh, encouraging and, and justifying mail-in ballots on a massive scale. And that's I, that, that, that was my impression. They used that to mail out millions of ballots to people, even if they didn't ask for it. So, but I didn't have any specific documentation of that other than what's been reported in the news media. Okay, and the last question is, how you can read or consider that uh, the mass media in US, they are, we all of us, we know that the mass media, they are not the authority for the election, but how you, how you consider that or affect directly in the in the mind of the of the people that AFP uh, declare that the Biden won the election or another <laughs> another mass media and they they didn't uh, rely on the election authority to the final to the final result. How you can consider they affect directly in the mind of the, in the, I mean, in the people of U.S., this, this situation? Well, you know, the mass media, the mainstream media here, which we call the lamestream media, is uh, basically in an op operating in a way of trying to condition the population of the United States to think and do certain things. For example, uh, before, the, before the election, they, they falsified or did very bad job polling people in terms of who is going to uh, vote for who. So uh, <clears throat> that was one form of conditioning to try to get people to think, well, everybody's going to vote for Biden, so we all should vote for Biden. You know, it's a conditioning process 
that's like uh, training. What is it? If you go through the psychological uh, uh, training books, they talk about training and Pavlov's dogs and training the dogs, how you train dogs. This is how they're training people just by mass media repetition and repetition makes right. I mean, I think even Adolf Hitler said, if you're going to tell a lie, tell a big one and tell it often until it's believed. And I would say also tell it from multi different directions from supposedly people in positions of authority. So then people get to automatically believe these things without actually challenging anything. And that's fundamentally what they did with the polling. And it's also true what the mass media was doing, trying to declare someone a, a, a candidate, a, a, the elected candidate, when in fact, all the votes aren't in yet, and they don't have uh, the th required 270 electoral votes yet to win. Thank you very much. Uh, please go ahead, David Meiswinkle. And then... uh, thank you. I have a few questions for you, Bill. I mean, yep. uh, your studying of the uh, the Russian Gate. Are there similarities uh, with that that election and that uh, the aftermath? Uh, compared to what uh, we're experiencing now, as far as the uh, more or less a clandestine operations, is there a pattern that you see at all? Uh, well, <clears throat> I think the pattern of disinformation is pretty much an intelligence one. Um, I mean, it's a standard thing that the Russians called it disinformatia. You know, we call it disinformation or manipulatia, manipulation. It's the same thing. It's a standard an, uh, intelligence technique that's been you know, used down through the centuries. I mean, even in, uh, in World War II, if you recall, when, when they were using uh, uh, General Patton as a decoy for another army for the invasion at Calais across the shortest distance to France, they, they deceived the, uh, Hitler and, and uh, his generals by putting him there. I think the generals were, were not quite deceived, but uh, Adolf Hitler was, and so that made the difference. But but it's a it's a it's a process that they it's a standard process for the intelligence stuff. So it's not that's the thread I see. And in fact, I think General uh, Senator Schumer, when he was uh, talking to about uh, talking on CNN, I think it was about uh, General uh, Trump when he was coming in to be president, he said he better not go against the intelligence community because they've got uh, six ways of Sunday to get back at you. Well, this is one of them, you know. So uh, I mean, this is not. Uh, I mean, and even the Goose for Two material, we were able to prove it. It had the signatures of what came out of CIA. So all the, and all the information we could assemble in terms of evidence that it was pointing to CIA as the originator of Goose for Two. So that, you know, and that, that basically says, uh, you know, that software we, we referred to in terms of Goose for Two was uh, the marble framework for, that was compromised in Vault 7 by WikiLeaks again. We were getting the truth from WikiLeaks. And what are they trying to do? Shut down WikiLeaks. Why? Because they don't want anybody to know the truth. So, you know, this is, this is basically a, a, a totalitarian police state that we live in right now. And, and the intelligence community is the one enabling it all. Right. Now, you mentioned something about the, uh, the pandemic. And, uh, you know, my organization, we've done study into the anthrax attacks in 2001. In fact, there's a, a congressional petition to try and reopen those investigations because we felt that the FBI didn't do a, the proper investigation and the, the person that was uh, fingered for the, uh, the killings, uh, Bruce Ivins, who conveniently mm -hmm. commits suicide, and then he's declared the, uh, the uh, culprit that uh, he didn't do that. He was a, a scientist at uh, Yosemite. Mm -hmm. That uh, possibly those that may have done it were in institutions beyond uh, the Fort Detrick. In other words, Fort Detrick wasn't the, the source. But uh, people like Francis Boyle, who wrote the uh, the weapons uh, World Weapons uh, Bio Bioweapon Treaty, uh, he believes that what we're experiencing with this pandemic is another bioweapon. That the anthrax attacks on uh, Senators Daxo and Leahy back in 2001 was a bioweapon, and it was an AIM strain, which means it was an American strain of, of anthrax. And uh, so now we have uh, this pandemic, which some people are thinking that it may be a bioweapon. And you mentioned the, uh, the fact that when uh, President Trump ran for office, uh, this uh, pandemic was a uh, important reason for all these mail-in ballots 
So maybe you can just address that. You mentioned intelligence in the Russian gate and per perhaps intelligence in this gate, this situation. And we're talking too of, of anthrax where it was a bioweapon, which uh, seemed to possibly involve intelligence. Certainly it was a high level beyond Fort Detrick. And now we're talking possibly about this uh, COVID and the, an attack on the world, but in particular here in the United States, which it seems to have affected, at least in some part, this election and the way it's, the people are being able to vote. Maybe you can just talk about that for a moment. And then I have just one follow-up question. Yeah, I think, uh, Dave, I, I've got, uh, I have some information might be, uh, that I haven't validated yet, but I th think is reliable. Uh, in, uh, in Germany, uh, some people have found an article or a request for funding back in March of 2019. Uh, and it was like the Bavarian government was requesting an allocation of 22 billion euros uh, for planning for a corona pandemic. Um, so this seemed to be uh, something we should be calling this uh, COVID-19 uh, program as a pandemic, <laughs> not, not a not a not a really a disease. That's this is something that seems to be people were planning for. So uh, if this is true, the, then then you know it puts in question the source, uh, the motivation uh, worldwide for all of this, uh, and you know I. <laughs> I think a lot of it is a condemic myself, because why why would one uh, want to incarcerate or confine people who aren't sick? I mean, the standard procedure, as far as I knew, for the last several hundred years, is if you had somebody that got sick with a contagious disease, you can find them and the people in their in their local or close in environment, and, and so uh, that's been the procedure for uh, you know as long as I know of, and. Uh, and instead, what we did now with this case is we all of a sudden we we can find everybody sick or not. So I mean, this just didn't make any sense, uh, you know, scientifically or you know, uh, getting herd immunity quickly wouldn't happen that way. That's for sure. And now we're seeing uh, you know continuations of things. And I think the testing as it gets better and better, we're finding out that many more people had this than than we thought. And it's nothing new. It's nothing that's spreading. It, they've already had it. So I, I just think that a lot of this was a fabrication and, and it may have been planned as you were, I think, indicating there, suggesting, Mike, Dave, that, that, that it may have been planned as a way of subverting the election process here in the States, you know, as a yep. way of making sure to ensure that people uh, got millions of mail-in ballots where they could uh, subvert the entire election easily that way. So Yeah, well, the, 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 there was a history of the intelligence agencies Actually, doing I'm, that. I'm sorry, I just... The, the time we have for each witness for the first round is a little short, I, so I want to make sure that Juan Francisco Soto is able to ask his question, and then we can we can circle back as time Very allows. Good. Okay. And then Marino El Saviv. Uh, Juan Francisco Soto, please. I wanted to ask about the impact, the the irrational, Ill, illogical impact in terms of mathematics and so on, but. Uh, the idea of the votes that came in in a fraction of minutes or the blue wave votes that came in, uh, in in a very rapid rate, this massive load of votes, is there any basis uh, for this? That's, is there any actual official basis for how this could happen? Because it seems to break the entire harmony of the proceeding of the number of votes because uh, Trump was winning, it seemed. And then all of a sudden, uh, in a in a way that uh, seems to break with all of the uh, patterns that were occurring, it seems quite illogical. There was a very large arithmetic leap where this all directly goes to Joe Biden and to his lead. And so this would seem to have to do with a computational system. I would like to know if you think that is the case or is there some issue that's in doubt here? <clears throat> no, no, I think that uh, mathematically, I think you're absolutely right. That is the case. Uh, uh, for example, if you remember the sequence of events was the, the voting stopped in certain states, about six states all simultaneously or very close to it. At the same time, they, they stopped and then all went home, at least the Republican portions did, and the Democrats came back and then they wouldn't let the Republicans back in to monitor the voting count. And, and they, some of them had to go to court to get a, uh, a, a court order to get back in, to be able to monitor and verify the validating the votes. 
Well, this is shows this is very signs of obvious corruption right a bit, but just taking it by the numbers. Uh, uh, President Trump said that there are after the close down early in the morning, 3.30 or so in the morning, 100,000 votes came in in Philadelphia and they were all for uh, Biden. Well, well if, you, if you simply mathematically say, well, at least one in a thousand in Philadelphia should have at least voted for, for, uh, for Trump. That meant out of the 100,000, you'd have at least 100 votes for President Trump. Well, the random probability for each of them being not voted is like one in a, you'd have like one in a thousand, say one, 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 one in a thousand to the hundredth power, which is like a one followed by 200 zeros. That is almost infinitely better than, than DNA matching. So, uh, you know, this is higher credibility, much higher credibility than doing a DNA match that this is in fact the case, that these were stuffed ballots. They were falsified ballots input into the system to be counted. I mean, so mathematically, it doesn't, it says that this is a, this is a, a fraud, period. Uh, Mr. Soto, do you have a follow-up question before we move to Marino El Saviv? Okay, uh, Marino El Saviv, please. Thank you very much from Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Uh, Mr. Binney, uh, I'd like to take advantage of your experience and your expertise. We have seen in the information which you have provided to us the, the use of orders that might be used and which have historically have been used and which have to do with the Nazi special order uh, 48. The idea of jailing people uh, without any judicial order. Now, since you have experience in these matters, this information which you have just presented here in Philadelphia, uh, tens of thousands of votes which were registered. And by the way, something similar to this happened here in the Dominican Republic in the internal election of President Leonel Fernandez, who was made to lose by votes that came in. Do you believe that some sort of algorithm was used or some sort of application, uh, an electronic application that channeled votes to, uh, to bring about that, that feat or that accomplishment uh, from a technological standpoint and thereby turn the vote, the real vote away and to make the necessary manipulation or alteration uh, that you have indicated with regard to the voting patterns of Americans in this uh, recent election. Uh, here's my impression of the entire process, uh, including the mathematics of it. So uh, <clears throat> uh, what it looked like was, and they found some evidence of, of moving votes from President Trump to uh, Biden. Uh, so they had some basis for that, and it looked like there was an algorithm running. Uh, but here's my impression of it was that the algorithm they put in place and distributed around to all the systems in place wasn't, wasn't strong enough a, a conversion to overcome the landslide voting for President Trump. So in the end, they had to, uh, they had to revert back to the old way of doing it, it is stuffing the ballot box with fake votes. So in order to do that, they'd had to shut down the voting, get all the Republicans out so nobody could witness it, and then come back in and bring all these votes in, uh, false votes, and then fill them out. And they had some video of people filling them out, uh, doing that uh, in these voting stations. So, so there's some evidence for that. And also the fact that these bulk amounts of data came, uh, it, vote, ballots came in and, and just mathematically changed so drastically the results was clearly mathematically an indication that this was a total fraud. And so my point was that there seemed to be an algorithm running but it wasn't strong enough to overcome the landslide that Trump was getting. And so they had to revert, revert back to the old way of doing it, stuffing the ballot box with fake votes. Hmm. Mr. El Saviv, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, I have a second last question. We've seen and read in the press that, for example, in the state of Pennsylvania, the uh, followers of President Trump say that there were uh, uh, 
tens of thousands of votes that had been cast for Trump, but they say that there were between 100, 800,000 and 1.2 million illegal votes and that 8,000 dead people voted in this state. What do you think about this as an expert? What do you think about those charges that have been made by the legal team, uh, which is presenting uh, the, uh, the cases uh, on behalf of the Trump campaign and that this could perhaps rise to the level of the Federal Electoral Council. This could in fact become a legal case, could it not before the Supreme Court of the United States? Uh, yes, I, I, I believe that's exactly right. And I think that's where it should be. It should be in front of the Supreme Court because this is fundamentally fraud on a scale that we've never seen before across the entire country simultaneously. I mean, how can you coordinate the actions of like six different states to simultaneously stop counting? Then all of a sudden, all those, those same six states get all these extra new votes coming in late at night with nobody else around to validate the counting, then have the countings come out and say it's so skewed toward this one candidate. I mean, this is obviously a, a, a fraud on the scale that we've never experienced before. Uh, and so, you know, <clears throat> I, just, uh, I just think that that's, that needs to be dealt with legally. These people need to be held accountable. If we don't do that, then it's only going to get worse. If we allow people to get away with these crimes, I mean, what they're basically saying is nobody's vote counts, right? They're, they're basically, I think it's Stalin who said, doesn't matter who votes or how they vote, it only matters who counts the vote. And when you're recounting the votes and you're only one party and you keep the other party out, you're stacking the deck. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill Binney will be available for more questions in the, the second part of our event. We're going to move now to our second witness, Harley Schlanger. Uh, Harley is a longtime collaborator of Lyndon LaRouche, and he gives uh, daily updates for the LaRouche movement. He's speaking to us as a representative of the Schiller Institute uh, to give an overview of the vote fraud uh, allegations and the, the fight to overturn it. Please, Harley. Thank you, Jason, and uh, thank you, Bill, for that compelling picture you presented. I'm going to give an overview, which I hope you will conclude from the picture I present, that there was large-scale fraud in the 2020 election, that contrary to the media claim that it's baseless to say there's fraud, that there's no evidence of fraud, there is a basis, as you will see. And in fact, the attempt to dismiss charges without an investigation is part of the fraud. And there, with the widespread irregularities, the anomalies that Bill has pointed out, uh, to dismiss it by saying, well, that's just an election and, and we have to move on and Trump should walk away and, and concede gracefully, uh, is not just a, a fraud in an election, but an assault on the Constitution and on the American voter. Uh, significant evidence has already been provided, and I think all of you received links to some exhibits, the Sidney Powell, Michigan filing, which is I think 75 pages, the Michigan affidavits, the Georgia filing, which is 104 pages, and the dossier of Smartmatics, Lord Malik Brown. Smartmatic is one of the firms that uh, is most significant in the uh, tabulation of the vote totals. I, I will point out that we're f facing a problem with censorship in that Sidney Powell's Twitter account uh, was prevented, uh, people were prevented from retweeting her file for a period of time. It was then later lifted. But this is what we're facing in the United States today with the merger of big tech with the military industrial complex, which I'll get to in a moment. So I'm going to start with the context for this. Uh, as a backdrop to the assertion that there was fraud, you have to look at the fact that there are diehard opponents to Donald Trump who carried out a four-year campaign to discredit his election in 2016. When they say that Trump is not accepting the result of the votes in 2020, when did Pelosi, Schumer, and others, Adam Schiff and others, ever accept Trump's victory in 2016? And what they, uh, the, the charges against Trump from 2016 are actually baseless and without evidence, despite their constant repetition. Now, what I'm going to show you is that these forces, these diehard anti-Trumpers, had a motivation to commit fraud. They had the opportunity to commit fraud. 
and they also had the capability to commit fraud. Now, in discussing the anti-Trump networks, let me just identify who I'm referring to. We're talking about networks of British intelligence who were involved in the operation in Russiagate, who have a very close eye on the United States. This includes British intelligence, uh, the monarchy, GCHQ, which is the NSA equivalent in England, MI6 and the city of London. And their position was laid out in December 2018 in the House of Lords report, which said that Trump cannot be allowed to get a second term because that would be the end of the special relationship. So they had a vested interest in defeating Donald Trump. Secondly, the Obama intelligence team, whose fingerprints and activity is all over Russiagate and all over this election. The, this includes the CIA, including John Brennan, who was the former head, uh, and Gina Haspel, his, one of his protégés, who's now the head and is refusing to let documents be released. The director of national intelligence, Clapper, the FBI, the permanent bureaucracy in the Justice Department, all of them are part of this anti-Trump network, which possesses the motivation, the opportunity, and the capability to run a fraud. We're also talking about the Republican Never Trumpers, the Bush network, uh, and, and their involvement consistently in trying to undermine President Trump. And then the broader term of the military industrial complex, which includes Wall Street and the related corporate cartels, including the media cartel, and also now big tech and social media. Now, what's the motivation? What's the hostility to Trump? Well, this is the network which launched and continues to insist on carrying out the endless wars that President Trump promised to end. The regime changes, which not only are they carrying out all over the world, but now this fraud represents regime change in the United States. It's an anti-Russian policy, anti-China, but it's designed to keep Trump and Putin from ever working together. Secondly, they're pushing global financial restructuring. Why? because the system is collapsing. It wasn't saved after 2008. In fact, the instability was increased by the buildup of debt. And this is also the network that's pushing the anti-science Green New Deal globally, which will lead to global starvation, the lack of energy and food production, uh, expansion of disease and pandemics. Uh, this is a network which has been committed to policies that will allow that to increase as a danger. Now, look at who they're bringing in if Biden is uh, certified as president. The same network, the, the people behind Russiagate and the Ukraine impeachment, uh, the ones who have the technical capabilities to commit fraud and which are pause, poised, rather, if they do come in with Biden to storm into Washington to take us back to the good old days that the American voter rejected in 2016. This is the crowd that established the post-Cold War order, a unipolar world run by the city of London and Wall Street uh, through agencies such as the International Monetary Fund. And the US military was the chosen uh, power to enforce this. That's what the special relationship is, the US military imposing the global bankers dictatorship of London and Wall Street. And Donald Trump represented an existential threat to that because we, we need to recognize the system is bankrupt and the potential for a new sovereign, a new financial system of sovereign nation states centered around Russia, China, and the United States in an alliance is something that they feared Trump was trying to pull together. And that's why he was such a threat. Now, as for the opportunity, let me just call your attention to two things. Uh, one of them is the sabotage of an effort in 2017 by Donald Trump to actually ensure security in the voting system. You know, if you buy into the line that the Russians were hacking into the system and trying to elect Trump because of their hostility to Hillary Clinton, then shouldn't you have some way of assuring that we have a more secure system? And Trump, on May, 2000, May 11, 2017, issued an executive order to create a presidential advisory commission on election integrity. This was sabotaged by the very people we're talking about because they said 
that if you try to have voter security, that's really just an excuse to have voter suppression, to disqualify voters, to intimidate voters. Now, at the same time, they were trying to sabotage and successfully sabotaging Trump's initiative. They were putting out the story that there were 21 states whose electoral records were uh, hacked by the Russians. Uh, this was the Department of Homeland Security that said Russian hackers have targeted 21 states. Now, the Washington Post admitted that these cyber attacks were unsuccessful. But what they said is that you have to project integrity or belief in the integrity of the system uh, while expressing concerns about future threats. You have to have a balance there. Now, what do they mean by that? Well, they meant that you have to stop Donald Trump. And we saw this was the same network that was responsible for what Bill mentioned, the fake polls that were a run up to the election and the attempt to give Joe Biden a pass in his election campaign. Now, one other aspect of this is something called Red Mirage, and I won't go into the details, but Michael Bloomberg, who spent over $100 million to defeat Trump, set up a data firm, a, a data system firm called Hawkfish. And its purpose was to create the, a credible story that Trump will be ahead on election eve, but when the mail-in votes come in, Biden will win. But that you have to watch out because Trump is going to use the red mirage of the early voting to proclaim a victory and refuse to leave. So this was part of the whole setup for the vote fraud. Now, keep in mind, the media is key to this. Now, as to the capability, well, you just heard from Bill Binney, the capability that exists through the cyber systems. Uh, we've seen this since Edward Snowden came out and, and exposed the moves toward using these uh, technologies to set up a surveillance state, which is not only to watch you, but to control and manipulate you. And what Sidney Powell and her filings uh, presented was an argument that these technologies can shift the votes or switch votes out of sight instantly and can probably get away with it. Now, one of the cases that she brought up is the case of Smartmatic. And I'm just going to review very briefly this. Uh, the, you have the Executive Intelligence Review lengthy article that goes through this. But here you have what should be seen as a blatant conflict of interest. First of all, if you're concerned about foreign influence on US elections, why have a company whose CEO and one of the top board members is a member of the British Privy Council, an ally, a longtime ally and probably supporter of George Soros, who's been involved in all the anti-sovereignty activities of George Soros, who has a record that he brags about of interfering in election campaigns. Doesn't that seem to uh, set up some, some red flags? And in particular, the fact that he was a promoter, a coordinator, a liaison between the Privy Council and Barack Obama in 2007, 2008. So he was uh, or oriented toward a, an Obama-Biden administration. This is the man whose company was involved in counting the votes in a number of states. Now, Smartmatic was banned in Sweden, Switzerland, uh, Norway, Austria, the United Kingdom, and the Philippines from counting votes. The Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden did a study where they said, we have found security gaps making it possible to totally change the result of an election. And I believe it was the UK investigation that said, this is a fraud prone system. And we have it from Lord Malik Brown himself. He was involved in the Philippines where Smartmatic was used. And in the 2015 interview with the Philippine Daily Inquirer, he said that he issued a fraudulent exit poll in favor of Corazon Aquino, which then became the basis of a regime change operation that put her in power. And he said, Marcos never recovered from that. It was very exciting experience to watch. I've done an awful lot of campaigns since, 
but I still say I learned my whole business on the Corey Aquino campaign. So an open admission that he engaged in fraudulent election practices. Now, then we have the statement of the Smartmatic CEO in 2017. This is Antonio Mujica, uh, who's a Venezuelan who made this statement uh, when he was asked about charges that they tampered with the Constituent Assembly election that, that kept Maduro in power, or rather uh, Hugo Chavez. And he admitted the votes, quote, were tampered with and manipulated in 2000. Uh, this is his admission in 2017. He said, for the system to work, there must be people auditing the system. They didn't have poll watchers in Venezuela, and that affected one million votes. Now, keep that in mind when we get to the specific charges from Sidney Powell about the refusal, which Bill has already mentioned, to allow poll watchers in the contested so-called battleground states uh, in the 2020 election. Finally, I'll just mention very briefly the role of the Department of Homeland Security in setting up a cybersecurity operation under Christopher Kreps, who is a former security official from Microsoft, again, big tech. And the committee he set up included Smartmatic and Dominion, the other voting machine company that's under investigation uh, for uh, involvement in the fraud. According to an article in Bloomberg News in November 2018, Private equity controls the gatekeepers of American democracy. And they write that there are three companies, including Smartmatic, which dominate U.S. voting machine industry and that are controlled by obscure private equity companies that, are, that operate in secret. So if you think about this, what we've seen so far is that you had the motivation, opportunity, and capability to commit fraud in the hands of a very small group of people tied to intelligence networks, very wealthy groupings of uh, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, Hollywood. So the question is, what did they do? Because we know there are irregularities and anomalies, some of which have been pointed out so far. So what Sidney Powell identified in the first track is what she called old fashioned ballot stuffing, the standard fraud that's visible. And she and, and Giuliani have put together at least 400 sworn affidavits from people who saw some aspect of this fraud. The standard fraud, including counting ballots from uh, the absentee, that they didn't check the signatures, they weren't delivered properly, they were delivered late, they were added after the polls closed. Uh, she cited a study, Sidney Powell did, by a team that was headed by President Trump's former security, data security advisor in 2016. They said they ran major analyses of voters who had moved out of state but still voted in the state they had left, which is illegal. Voters who registered to vote using a post office box rather than a residential address as required. Voters who requested a mail-in ballot and sent it in only for it to not be counted. And voters who didn't request a mail-in ballot and didn't receive one, but discovered that a vote had been cast in their name. Uh, as well as research on people who voted more than once and those listed in the death index. And by the way, Joe Biden swept the dead vote, probably 100%, not surprising. Now, the numbers of voters they identified with these issues, this team of uh, data analysts, was 1.25 million. And here's what they found in three states. I'll just reference the three states. In Georgia, that there were 138,221 voters who had issues, such as the ones I just identified, different addresses, not requesting ballots, requesting ballots and not receiving them, but found out they were voting and so on. 138,000 plus. Biden technically leads in Georgia by 12,670 votes. So that needs to be investigated. Wisconsin, 26,673 with these issues. Biden allegedly won Wisconsin by 20,000 votes. Again, this has to be investigated. Arizona, 
almost 20,000 votes fitting this category of issues. And Biden won by 10,457. So in Georgia, Wisconsin, and Arizona alone, you have enough to overturn the results based on a full investigation of this. Again, irregularities and anomalies. And let me just bring up a somewhat humorous aside here on this question of anomalies. The comment by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi when she was asked, how come the Democrats lost House seats and yet defeated Trump? How do you explain that? And she said, well, the fact is that President Trump, to his credit, turned out a big vote. He turned out a big vote for Biden. I mean, even from the dizzy Nancy Pelosi, that's pretty wild. Now, we also have reports of large batches that were received after the, the shutdown, the pause and counting, uh, of which the reports are of 100 percent for Biden, not a single vote for Trump. And again, 400 affidavits that are included. Uh, some of them are included in the filings by Sidney Powell. On the refusal to allow access to poll watchers, they have examples from Georgia, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. In Georgia, what happened in the largest area, Fulton County, which is Atlanta, a water pipe broke. They emptied the vote counting area except for three or six, depending on different accounts, of election officials who remained and counted while all the poll watchers were removed. Uh, this is something that they have film of, that people were, were removed. There's film footage in Pennsylvania of people being physically removed from the area where poll watchers were supposed to be, and in Michigan, where they put cardboard boxes up on the, the glass windows so the poll watchers couldn't see in. You also have a, a very significant case coming up in uh, Georgia, where the Secretary of State violated the law passed by the legislature, which required signature verification. Uh, this is a primary uh, aspect of election law. The Secretary of State has no right to change these things by the Constitution. These are laws that are set by the state legislature. Now, the same thing is, is at the center of the Pennsylvania fight. Uh, as Jason mentioned at the beginning, there's a motion to have a vote in the House and Senate of Pennsylvania on Monday to overturn the award and certification of the Biden electors based on the many, many examples of fraud which were presented at this hearing in Gettysburg last Wednesday. But one of the issues that comes up is that the legislature had set the deadline, the law on the deadline as to when votes had to be in to be counted. That was changed at the last minute by the Secretary of State, who has no right to do that. And so once again, we see changes that were made by local Democratic officials that violate the Constitution and the laws that were set by various state legislatures. So we'll see what happens with this hearing on Monday, but this is something that, that the um, Trump campaign is saying will also be investigated, or they're going to have a hearing, rather, similar hearing in Arizona and I, I think Nevada. I'm not sure of the other state. But now the second track that Sidney Powell looked at, and as I said, this is what we just went through is standard aspects of fraud. Well, the harder question is cyber, the cyber theft. Now, first of all, you can start with the fact that there were repeated warnings about the Smartmatic system, including from Democratic senators Elizabeth Warren and Amy Klobuchar. In Georgia, even Stacey Abrams, the darling of the liberals there, had warned about moving to the Dominion system, which was the other system. Now, when you're, you're talking about Dominion and Smartmatic, you're talking about the machines that are used in counting most of the votes in the country. Dominion equipment was used in the battleground or, or the, the states that would determine the Electoral College margin. These are North Carolina, Nevada, Georgia, Michigan, Arizona, and Pennsylvania. Altogether, there were 28 states that used the Dominion equipment. Uh, and in they were used in, in 
states that had 40% of the U.S. voters, as well as some of the largest counties like Maricopa County in Arizona, Clark County in Nevada, 47 counties in Michigan, in which there were a number of irregularities. Uh, in Georgia, there was a so-called glitch in Morgan and Spalding counties due to an upload the night before, which is highly unusual. Uh, in Michigan, there was one county in which a swing of 6,000 votes from Trump to Biden was caught by an observant election worker and the votes were returned to Trump. Were there other counties like that? Uh, in Gwinnett County, Georgia, which is a suburb of Atlanta, they found 4,000 votes that were lost due to a bad data card. So you have a number of these kinds of cases, but then you have uh, what Sidney Powell put together is expert testimony on the ability to manipulate the counting using cyber uh, techniques. Uh, Dr. Andrew Apple from Princeton claimed that in looking at the Dominion machine, he was able to hack it in seven minutes using a screwdriver. Uh, there's also a, an, another expert, Kashavaras Nia, who reported that he, uh, and he's someone who has long experience in the intelligence community, and uh, this goes to the question I, I believe that one of the panelists just asked, he said, intelligence has developed tools to infiltrate foreign voting systems, and Dominion is vulnerable to such data manipulation. So you have experts, including Bill Binney now, who have testified to this as a danger. There's also expert testimony on back doors that exist, openings to the internet, which would allow someone to come in and hack these systems. We also have the, the real anomaly of 100, 130,000 votes in Michigan, which came in all for Biden. So these, uh, expert analyses are all part of Sidney Powell's case. It's, this is just a sampling of what's documented in her case. Yet the media refuses to report it except to say it's baseless. Now, on dealing with cyber fraud, there's a request to impound all the machines that were used using, that were Dominion voting system machines. I would ask Bill Binney if he could comment on whether a backdoor switch, which would allow votes to be traced, if that's something that can be discovered through impounding a machine. Now, ultimately, as Roger Stone told me the other day, and, and Roger, as you probably know, is an expert on elections and election uh, activity, he said that in his view, Sidney Powell has compiled overwhelming evidence that fraudulent cyber activity took place. But, and this is a big but, he said, the proof lies in the files of the CIA and the National Security Council and should be investigated by the FBI. The files must be opened. You know, associates of Lyndon LaRue, such as myself, are familiar with 45 years of dealing with fraudulent elections. This goes back to the attacks on Lyndon LaRouche in New Hampshire in 1980, where his vote never appeared even though we had more signed affidavits in a number of precincts than they gave him actual votes. We actually did an investigation in 1976 into the Carter Ford race and found that in Ohio, Gerald Ford probably won, which would have made him president, but he decided not to fight the case. What we're dealing with here is a battle for fair elections the full accounting of all legal votes and the exclusion of illegal votes. Those with the capacity to commit fraud are accustomed to acting in the dark. That's why they're sometimes called the deep state or the shadow government. But this is a crime so large that its full exposure would shake up politics worldwide, precisely because these are techniques that have been used by U.S. agencies in other countries and now they're being deployed against the American people. This is not to be allowed or tolerated. If it's allowed to stand, we in the United States will not be allowed or not be enabled to refer to ourselves anymore as a republic because we will have betrayed the very principles of our republic and our nation. 
And that's why the full transparency is needed and not just in the voting, but should be extended to what I identified at the beginning, the lead up to this, the four years of a regime change coup that was being conducted against Donald Trump, which they think they finally succeeded in by fixing the vote on November 3rd. So that's, that's my report. Thank you very much, Harley. Um, we have a, a bit of a schedule constraint as we just had another witness uh, become available for us. So what I'd like to do now is just take one or two questions uh, for Harley. We're gonna hear from our new witness uh, very briefly, and then we'll go to our last witness, Richard Black, who will be able to take questions as will Harley, because I know there are more questions for Harley. So uh, pl uh, please, uh, Simone Levy. Oh, may I, I'm sorry, also, I'd, I'd like to request, give, our time is limited and our topic is the elections. Mm -hmm. Our witnesses are fascinating people, but let's, let's please keep all of our questions related to the election. Okay, uh, Mr. Schlanger, thank you very much for, your, uh, for all your feedback. There is a, an evidence that there is a misleading situation in the, in, the, in the election. My question is, do you have an accurate, um, accurate mm -hmm. amount or proof or evidence of uh, deed certificates that they can show or bring any uh, committed irregularity on the, on the base that we can name uh, the word fraud instead or instead of uh, committed irregularity. This is the first and the second. I I remember the all the statements of uh, Mr. Miller uh, with Arizona, and uh, I bring and and I want to bring that uh, situation into the table just for the Georgia situation after the physical count of ballots. They they show that uh, Biden won uh, the the count. Do you have any evidence of the 14th ballots that shows that Biden won Georgia? Do you have any legal evidence or the or any evidence of fraud on this situation? Those are my two questions. Thank you very much. Well, I think what I went through from Sidney Powell's case is that she has put together a certain amount of, of numbers and a pattern of fraud. Now, the problem you have when you do it with the ordinary ballot stuffing question is that in order to get a court to rule in your favor, technically you're supposed to show that the fraud was sig significant enough that it would change the outcome of the election. Now, I, I don't have, if you give me a moment, I'll find these figures again, which I think are, interesting that we're pulled together by this one team. Yeah. In the three states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Arizona, there are issues that they discovered that include dead people voting, people who don't live at addresses in a state anymore, but still voted at those addresses. For example, if you live in Wisconsin and then you move to Minnesota, uh, can you vote in Minnesota and Wisconsin? Well, they found large numbers of cases where that happened. In uh, Wisconsin, 26,673 votes that fit into these questionable categories, which would, over, if they were all done for Biden, that would turn the election around. In uh, Georgia, 138,000. That's the most egregious case. And in Arizona, 19,997, where there was a 10,000 a uh, 400 vote victory for uh, allegedly for Biden. So in these cases, you do have the numbers. Now, how do you, what's the ironclad evidence? Where there is ironclad evidence is that there were irregularities that took place out of sight illegally when they moved people away, when they did counting without poll watchers, where they didn't verify signatures. Now, what Sidney Powell is requesting is that those votes, which were not adequately uh, brought up for scrutiny, should not be counted. If you can't confirm that a vote was legal, why should it be counted? 
And that's what she is calling for in, in uh, part of the remedy that's proposed. Besides impounding the machines and, and besides uh, just looking into the, the violation of the orders, for example, in, in Pennsylvania, where they changed the law as to how, how late the votes can come in. Besides that, they do have these numbers of votes which are questionable. And if they're questionable, do you allow them to count? And she's saying they should not be counted and that there are enough of these votes that would overturn the election in at least those three states, uh, Wisconsin, Georgia, and Arizona. There's also going to be a hearing in the court in Nevada on Monday where there were, uh, I think in Clark County, the city of Las Vegas, large numbers of, of votes that should not have been counted of people who moved, people who were dead. I don't have, she didn't have the figures on that because she hasn't filed anything for Nevada yet. But the Trump campaign claims that Nevada was another case of, of uh, blatant fraud. So that's, that's the best I can tell you. Thank you. Thank you. So Harley, we're going to, um, we're going to take a quick shift of gears here. And what we're going to do is, you will be able to ask questions of Harley. But what we're going to do now is we're going to turn to uh, another witness that we have on hand. Uh, Benny Smith, who is uh, available. Benny Smith, a voting commissioner, Benny Smith, was appointed to the Shelby County, Tennessee Election Commission in April 2019. He works in analytics and innovation. His research is credited for uncovering an extraordinarily high-risk tampering mechanism and provides a new method for analyzing questionable election results. That research is part of a proof of concept that he developed with black box voting to examine election system vulnerabilities. He operates SmartSoft, a consulting firm, and his research has been presented in numerous fora across the country. Uh, we'd like to welcome Benny Smith to offer uh, a short presentation to us. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I primarily want to speak about something that has, has, has gotten a lot of attention uh, with the current election. Um, it was the discovery that is this infrastructure whereby the voting systems allow uh, its citizens to be counted as if we're counting money. And a lot of the questions that are being asked are, is it, is it possible that some type of algorithm can run and redistribute voting totals? And the short answer to that is yes, but the long answer is, is a little bit more nuanced. However, um, blackboxvoting.org, we wrote about this in 2016. It was a study, it's a six part study that we did. It was called Fraction Magic. And basically it's the removal of one person, one vote. And it's a feature, it's not a bug. It's a type of race that's embedded within the election equipments, uh, in, within the election equipment that allows for weighted elections. And that weighted election is best described as if I own 6.92 acres of land and you own uh, 3.27 acres of land, then my vote of 6.92 should count more than yours. And when that is running, it is troubling if you don't know it because you can literally weight races based on who you want to win. Uh, and that was a, a subject of, of, of a study that I did recently. I became intrigued when Michigan admitted that they had about 6,000 votes that were uh, accounted for Biden, that they were supposed to have been counted for Trump. And I think at the end of uh, the totals, they found out that Trump won that county by 2,500 votes versus losing it by 6,000. Uh, and then we commissioned a study to see if we could chase that algorithm and see if it had a signature and we are doing pattern analysis and we found out some very interesting things in Michigan. We looked at the four most populous counties and what you, what you expect to see is like a parabola. And what we saw was a, a, a diagonal slope, which was uh, very interesting. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we found the presence of the algorithm, but it does suggest that you need to look further. And I think in Antrim County, where a, a random person saw that that the totals didn't look right because it was it was like a completely Republican dominated county that voted Democrat, which which doesn't make sense to a local. And they the only way that they could get the true total was to go and look at the um, 
hand counted, they had to hand count it and get back to the totals. So it's something that um, is very relevant now. There are some people talking about it and I don't think they have a full understanding or appreciation of it. So you have to be somewhat wary of some of the people who are who are, are, are alleging that, that, that they found this somehow. I think some people are using the New York Times data. Uh, that's a futile exercise, I wouldn't do that. Um, there's some technical reasons why. Uh, however, that uh, series Fraction Magic, if you go to blackboxvoting.org and search Fraction Magic, there, there, there's going to be a video in a six part series uh, that will really educate the public. Uh, we do have to police the republic. We shouldn't leave this up to, to hardware and software to count elections. I'm, I'm a hand marked paper ballot, probably counted in public on camera. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just ask one very quick question before we move to our next speaker. Um, you had said that there, you had done research showing, um, you know, this use of fractional voting, and you cautioned against uh, the New York Times data. If you, if it's possible to explain in in a way that you think our audience could understand, could you briefly say what the problem is, or what some of the poor analyses you've seen that use that data? Right. It, it's, it's improper to try to back your way into a number. These, these methods of fractional counting are powerful financial allocation methods. And for instance, the New York Times data is only giving a percentage, and they are basically showing 53.4% of a total. And if you try to multiply 53.4% uh, to a million, you don't have the decimal precision. If you just go by a gas station, you know, you're going to see three decimal places, even though the penny ends at the second decimal place. And there's a reason for that. Um, so if you don't have a, if you only have one decimal place, then when you multiply that times a whole number, you don't have the precision that's required to get back to a whole number. While it may still be a fraction of a number, the New York Times isn't give its output isn't giving you enough detail to get back to an original number. Okay, great. Th thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Benny Smith. Um, I hope you may be available for more questions later if they come up, we'll see. Um, so you're, you're invited to, to stay on if you're able to. We'll turn now to our last uh, scheduled witness and then be able to have plenty of discussion among the, the panelists and questions. Our last witness today, scheduled witness, is uh, uh, former state senator Richard Black. He served in the Marines. He achieved the rank of colonel in the United States Army, and he'd served in both the Virginia House of Delegates and in the Virginia State Senate. Uh, Senator Black, Colonel Black, please. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you. Uh, I might also mention I was the chief of the criminal law division uh, for the Army at the Pentagon and uh, uh, testified before Congress, prepared executive orders for the President of the United States and personally advised the Senate Armed Services Committee on issues of very, very uh, great sensitivity like the tailhook uh, uh, incident. But uh, my concern is that uh, there was a, a flurry of activity uh, relative to uh, the obedience of the uh, of the military uh, to the president of the United States. Uh, and um, the, the ra rather rapid sequence of events uh, began with, a, uh, with an article that was published in the, uh, in the Washington Post. And uh, it was uh, entitled, Five Myths About Coups. It was just sort of a general uh, public interest story. But uh, it laid out uh, what they consider to be five myths about coups. And they said, uh, they're, they're a thing of the past. Well, not true. They're not necessarily a thing of the past. They only happen in poor nations. Well, no, they actually happened in France. And they gave that as uh, an example of one that they consider to be rather successful. They said they're always violent. No, they're not always violent at all. Uh, so they're sort of downplaying the risk of violence. Uh, they always lead to instability. No, they don't necessarily lead to instability. And they're always bad for democracy. No, the Washington Post says coups are not necessarily always bad for democracy. Uh, so this was just sort of an interesting public uh, public interest story. Uh, 
published published by the uh, Washington Post, <clears throat> which works rather closely with the CIA, the the uh, the State Department, the generally the deep state establishment, including that portion of the Pentagon that falls in that category. Now, what happened is uh, several days later, well, several weeks later, uh, June the 1st, 2020, there were large scale riots in Washington, D.C. Uh, the rioters seized St. John's historic Episcopal Church, which is very close to the White House, and they torched it. Um, this chapel, uh, served virtually as the, the chapel for the, the White House, uh, dating back to 1816 when it was constructed. And uh, presidents of both parties have historically used a particular pew in that church. So it really is considered to be uh, very much a part of the presidency and all the trappings of the presidency. <clears throat> Well, by torching it, uh, the, the rioters were undermining the authority of the president to some extent. And uh, so Donald Trump decided that he was going to walk from the White House uh, over to St. John's. And he was going to demonstrate the fact that, first of all, the uh, federal government remains in charge. Uh, it's not, uh, we're not under the rule of the mob. And uh, he was also going to make the point that we respect the freedom of religion and the ability of people to worship without uh, violent interference. So he went uh, with a number of his uh, cabinet members and, and so forth. And, and he, uh, he posed in front of the, uh, uh, in front of St. John's and he held up a Bible and uh, he did that uh, as a photo opportunity, but also to make a very important point that the president remained in control of the United States and that uh, he was not uh, forced to remain in isolation on the grounds of the White House. Now, what happened then, and this appears to me to be quite orchestrated, on June the 3rd, General James Mattis, the former Secretary of Defense, came out and uh, he made quite a frightening denunciation of the President of the United States. He began by praising the rioters for their wholesome and unifying demands. Well, if, uh, if, if beating and looting and burning and assassinating uh, police officers is somehow wholesome and unifying, I would hate to see uh, what is disruptive in this country. But in any event, he praised the rioters, and then he denounced the president in rather scathing terms. And he said, we're witnessing the consequences of three years without mature leadership. Then he said something that was rather disturbing. He made this comment, he said, we can unite without him, drawing on the strengths inherent in our civil society. So the question is exactly what did General James Mattis mean by saying we can unite without him? He was obviously not talking about the fact that we've got an election coming up and maybe he favored Biden over Trump, which is perfectly acceptable. He seemed to have been talking about something more fundamental and more disturbing than that. <clears throat> By coincidence, uh, Bob Woodward uh, announced his upcoming book entitled Rage. And in the book Rage, uh, he quotes uh, James Mattis, who was then the Secretary of State, and he was talking to the then Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coates, and he said that the president, this is James Mattis, said that the president was dangerous and unfit. And he went on to say there may come a time when we have to take collective action against Trump. Again, that does not sound to me like he's talking about 
we all need to go out and vote for for Trump's opponent. We need to to uh, get a new president. That sounds to me like he's talking about some more direct action, uh, which certainly is impermissible. It's important to remember that James Mattis, when he was the Secretary of Defense, uh, he was the one who resigned from Secretary of Defense in order to block the president from withdrawing troops from Syria. And he was very successful in doing that. He created turbulence in the chain of command. John Bolton, who was then the national security advisor, flew uh, to the Middle East. And there he announced that we were not withdrawing. Contrary to what the president had said, he basically countermanded the president. Uh, so in any event, so we had these very disturbing statements by James Mattis. Now, uh, on June the 4th, just a day later, Foreign Policy, which is certainly a publication of the Deep State, uh, published a morning brief uh, entitled Generals Denounce Trump's Protest Plan. And um, uh, so they, they critiqued the president's threat to, to invoke the Insurrection Act. Now, the Insurrection Act is an act designed to allow the president to restore good order and discipline throughout the United States. Uh, this is one of the purposes for which the United States established a constitution uh, to ensure domestic tranquility. And uh, the foreign policy article subtly disparaged the relevance of the Insurrection Act as a two century old law. But the fact is that uh, that law has been invoked 22 times since it was first used in 1808, and it was last used in 1992. Uh, and uh, at that time, I was involved very much in in the uh, uh, in putting down the riots uh, that occurred in Los Angeles. Uh, so it was a very viable thing. Now. The, the source of support for the Insurrection Act comes from two things. One is from federal statute. So there is an inherent duty in the president to maintain uh, domestic tranquility. And so these are two separate sources of authority for, for uh, calling into effect the use of, of federal troops. And what was happening is that the, the generals had decided to conduct something that was orchestrated to undermine the president's ability to, uh, to use uh, the Insurrection Act or something similar to it, his inherent powers, uh, to put down the riots that were raging across the United States uh, at that time. Now, during the week of June the 7th, uh, just, just very closely after General Mattis came out against the president, General Colin Powell uh, led a large group of retired military officers and uh, Pentagon officials in blasting the commander in chief. Some of them used re quite scathing language. For example, there was a retired Marine Corps General, John Allen, who very arrogantly claimed Donald Trump isn't religious, he has no need of religion, and he doesn't care about the devout, except insofar as they serve his political needs. Well, there were quite a number of generals who came out and who made these personally scathing remarks. And I'll just mention that under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, retired military officers are accountable for uh, using contemptuous words against the president. Now, they can disagree with the president's policy. There's no problem with that. They can say that they intend to vote for somebody else because they think he's better. No problem. But when they use statements that are personally contemptuous, those are criminal offenses under Article 88 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which is uh, law 
passed by Congress and uh, signed by the president. And so I think the feeling was that if enough of them did it, that uh, they would there would sort of be safety in numbers that uh, they could get away with it. And many of these were quite scathing and quite personal in nature. Um, now, Colin Powell, had le he led the charge of all of these people. It's important to remember that Colin Powell is the, is the man who uh, notoriously held up a test tube of simulated sarin gas and deceptively told the United Nations that uh, Iraq was, was going to unleash sarin gas on the world, which of course was false. It was a lie. I believe he knew that it was a lie at the time he said so. And, uh, and as a result, a couple of million people in Iraq, innocent people have been killed. The Christian community has been almost driven out of Iraq. Thank you very much, Colin Powell. Um, now, the, the whole movement begins to accelerate. And by August the 11th, Defense One, which is a very, very prominent online military publication uh, with advertisers such as Raytheon and Boeing, very, very respected companies, uh, they published a, um, a, uh, an open letter by two retired lieutenant colonels, John Nagel and Paul Yingling, and it was addressed to General Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And they urged Mark Milley to uh, employ military force to remove the president if he did not leave office on January the 20th. And they wrote, if Donald Trump refuses to leave office at the expiration of his constitutional term, the United States military must remove him by force and you must give that order. Now, you might think, okay, here we've got a couple of retired lieutenant colonels. Maybe they sat around with a bottle of bourbon and they drank too much and they did some bizarre thing and they sent a letter. Well, what is noteworthy is that that letter gets published in one of the most prominent publications dealing with defense matters. And I think that in itself was very disturbing. Now, obviously, uh, retired military officers do not have the authority to urge the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to overthrow the government of the United States. Um, and, uh, and yet uh, there, was, there was not a whisper of it uh, from the Pentagon. The Pentagon, General Milley said nothing about it. Uh, Mark Esper, the Secretary of Defense, said nothing about it. It was just as low. Well, all right, we got somebody calling for the overthrow of the government. And uh, so that was quite disturbing. Um, <clears throat> August the 18th. Now, all of these things, they're going in sequence rather rapidly. August the 18th, Defense One uh, published an article by Thomas uh, Crosby entitled Six Scenarios for Military Intervention. And they discussed uh, plausible, rather implausible scenarios. And he said, well, coups are nasty things, but uh, we kind of need to discuss them. And he says, uh, facing these scenarios may help us understand the real dynamics that general and flag officers will be forced to navigate in the coming months. In other words, he was saying that our top military brass needed to contemplate the need to oust the president of the United States. Now, fortunately, uh, the Schiller Institute took the lead and we, we got uh, 600,000 hits. Uh, and uh, we, I think we put some pressure on the Pentagon. Mark Milley came out. And at long last, he did say that, uh, almost parroting what I have said, which is that the U.S. military has no role whatsoever in the uh, selection of the president of the United States and in resolving any dispute about, uh, about the, uh, the military, uh, uh, rather about the selection of the president. So 
Uh, I think we have dodged a bullet with the Pentagon. However, I think it's instructive to realize the depth and the breadth of this electoral coup that has taken place to recognize that there was a plan B to employ military force if it became very difficult to, uh, to resolve this thing through legitimate constitutional means. Uh, very, very dangerous, and it shows just how far uh, under President Obama the military has drifted from its constitutional role and how dramatically in need of, of purging and, uh, and getting this organization back on track we have, we have gotten. So uh, fortunately, I think we, we have passed the military phase and we're, we're more focused on the judicial phase, but we need to recognize just how dangerous this coup to subvert the elections and to oust the president of the United States has become. Thank you very much, Colonel Black. We will now open the floor to our panelists, our legal experts from uh, the United States and around the world to pose questions to Colonel Black, and then we'll be able to open it up also for questions to our other witnesses, including Harley Schlanger, who was uh, didn't have much of a chance to have questions posed to him. So uh, uh, please, would you have a question for Colonel Black? Yes, Juan Francisco Soto. First, I would like to thank this expert witness from the uh, military lawyer, Colonel Black. I enjoyed listening to your testimony. I would like to ask you a question in your double uh, personality as a man of law and a military man. What do you think are the most flagrant cases of fraud which you personally consider uh, may have occurred in these elections? Well, it, it is my impression that uh, uh, during during the late hours of the night, we simultaneously had a number of the swing states shut down their reporting. And uh, at the time that they did, uh, those states were strongly leaning towards Trump, some of them very strongly, some of them he was ahead. and. Uh, then things just shut down and uh, several hours later suddenly all the results had flipped that just doesn't happen now one of the one of the clearest indicia of fraud is that there were large batches of uh, of ballots that were i believe cooked up during that period and i think there was such uh, such a desperate haste, kind of a panicky haste to reverse this because the 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 lead of Trump was, I, I think, far more than people had recognized. And so they did not take time to fill out the ballots down down ticket. In other words, they would vote only for the president and they would ignore the Senate race and the congressional race. Everybody who votes, votes for the president and vice president, for a senator, and for a congressman. And so there were, there were no votes for the senators or the congressmen. Now that can happen occasionally uh, in rare instances, but you're talking about one or two percent of people who would ever do that. People typically, if they go in to vote Democrat, they vote for the Democrat senator, the Democrat uh, congressman, usually. Same thing with the Republicans. But in this case, you had enormous numbers. I mean, well over 100,000 votes in some cases where nobody bothered to vote for senator, nobody bothered to vote for congressman. That does not happen. I will tell you that I've been through 13 contested elections myself, and generally you'll have your 
your votes uh, consistent with whoever's at the top of the ticket. And so sometimes I would do a little bit better than they would do. Sometimes I do a little worse than they would do. But always there was a correlation and a reasonably close correlation. Uh, in this case, there was zero, almost zero cor correlation. And that simply does not happen. Uh, we had the situation where they shut down the voting in uh, Georgia. And in Georgia, they claimed, well, there had been a, you know, a bursting of the water main and the whole, uh, the whole place was flooded out so they couldn't count the ballots. Uh, when they did a Freedom of Information Act request, uh, they discovered a, a little bit of texting back and forth where somebody said, well, look, we all we've got is, is, is a little minor leak. It didn't interfere with anything. Uh, we can take care of it later. No big deal. Um, so you had those things. You had uh, the election poll watchers who were driven out. And in some cases uh, uh, where there were windows allowing people to look in, they would go and they would they would put up cardboard over the windows so people couldn't observe. When observers were allowed in, uh, they were kept 25 feet back. Now, I don't know about your eyes, but I will tell you my eyes when I was a young man were extraordinarily sharp. And if somebody said, OK, I want you to read 12 point type from 25 feet away, I couldn't have read a single digit, a single word. And so uh, the, the, the degree of, of fraud was so massive that I think one, one thing that maybe it'll be a little bit beneficial uh, from now on, the United States is never going to be able to make these claims disparaging other countries, voting methods and techniques because uh, I'm not sure that I've seen one that was as corrupted as the one that we're dealing with today. <laughs> Great. Uh, yes, uh, Simon Levy. And then, um, then Thank we'll switch you. to Dave Meiswinkel next. Thank you. Uh, my first two questions, they were about related with uh, legal, legal questions, legal situation. Um, my current question is right now is, Coming back that on the appraisal that, as I already stated, uh, there is a misleading situation for all you have shared. But uh, I want to ask you if this is, uh, and uh, you already mentioned that, but I want just to stress, to stress again on the point. Is there any rational correlation with the data, an example with, with Georgia or any other state, considering that this rational correlation can prove or can evidence the term of fraud because all of us and with the evidence and with everything that you have shared we we can assure or we can state that there is a there is an evidence or of, of the conduction of the behavior of the of the voters on the on the election but I just want to make the difference of the of the legal term fraud and basically the any kind of irregularity. So that's that's why my my my, my question is going with the statement for the for the numbers, for the figures, for the rational correlation that they can they can evidence the name or the word or the term fraud. Thank you. Yes, I, and that is a good question. Uh, I, I am not very well qualified to, to address that. I, I can do it in just general terms. Um, the, the courts ultimately will be looking to see whether uh, what occurred in each state is enough to change the outcome of the election. Uh, so there may be there may be lots of evidence, evidences of fraud or 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 of, uh, you know, uh, of electoral malpractice. But uh, uh, 
uh, unless unless it can be shown that that would change the outcome of the election, then the courts are uh, are going to be disinclined to take action. Now, I think it'll be done on a state by state basis. For example, in Pennsylvania, we just had a ruling where uh, it uh, it's a preliminary injunction and it's a preliminary ruling. But part of the preliminary injunction requires a finding that it looks like the plaintiffs will succeed on the merits once the case is heard. And, uh, and this particular judge has said that uh, it does appear as though uh, unconstitutional methods were used in the Pennsylvania vote. And so there, there seems to be a reasonable possibility that the votes of Pennsylvania will be thrown out. Um, in some cases, such as Arizona, uh, you have a very, very close election, and, and it may just be that, that uh, individual cases might just flip it one way or the other. Um, but the, the, the real question, I think what you're getting at is, whether some of these really massive cases of fraud uh, where logic and common sense tell you that it's fraudulent, will, will that proof be accepted by the Supreme Court or by lower courts to throw out an election? Uh, I can't tell you that for certain. I do know, for example, that there is evidence that uh, that uh, in Detroit that during this time that the the uh, rolls had been shut down uh, in a coordinated fashion across the United States, that uh, there's evidence that uh, there were 138,000 ballots that were driven in and delivered, and that. Uh, uh, those ballots uh, were all for uh, for uh, Biden, and there were none for the senator, none for the congressman. Logic would tell you that can't happen. That's impossible. Even, I mean, there are going to be a certain number of people who simply, maybe because they're, you know, losing their mental faculties, they check the wrong box. Uh, so. So you know that some of these things are are wrong. They are they are fraudulent. But I'm not sure. I, I can't tell you for a fact what uh, evidence the courts will be willing to accept. Uh, but uh, uh, there there's no doubt that whatever happens, if if Biden should be uh, sworn in eventually. He will be a very weakened president because a great number of Americans will perceive him as someone who was not legitimately elected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one more thing, if I am allowed. Um, let's let's switch to Dave Meiswinkle and, and then okay. get to your follow up question, please. Perfect. Yes, th thank you, Colonel, very much. Uh, you began your, your talk with talking about coup, and then we look at uh, presently when the election was uh, we talk about the fraud now talking about the coup uh you mentioned the media could you just go into that a little bit the media and take that back to uh, george soros and the antifa and the causing of the disturbances throughout the uh, summer in this country and that how that was perhaps some preparation for what we're experiencing uh, as a result of the election yes i um it is very interesting. Now think about it. When the election was held, it was as though the Democratic Party turned a faucet. You haven't heard anything about uh, riots and looting and and police being murdered in their cars and people being forced to kneel down and and uh, and beg forgiveness for for white, uh, you know, whatever they call it, white privilege. Um, it's, it's, they turned it off like a faucet. They control this. Um, the, the idea that you can have massive 
uh, uprisings that last a long time is it's just not realistic. Now you can have you can have an explosion of anger, and some of the initial things that happened after the George Floyd incident were probably in that nature. But when they last on and on, for example, you know we still have one going on in uh, in uh, Oregon. I don't think it's completely shut down there. It is enormously expensive. Someone uh, had to pay to stage the pallets of bricks that people used to throw along the way. Uh, someone over the months had to pay the living expenses, the food, the salaries for all the rioters. Uh, and this, this goes into many millions of dollars. And uh, uh, in the Ferguson, Missouri situation, where they did have months and months of rioting, turned out uh, George Soros was deeply involved in funding that. Um, so the this is this is sort of a technique used by the Democrats uh, as we approach each presidential election. Uh, they will. Uh, they will single out an incident, and usually they cut and chop the the video, make it look just so outrageous that it's unbelievable, and then they they prompt these uh, these riots and civil disturbances. And the sad thing, I mean, many sad things. It's very sad for all of us, but uh, within the black community, you've got you've got a lot of people who want to work hard. They want to raise families, do good things. And uh, and here you saw uh, Antifa teamed up with Black Lives Matter, and you'd see some of these white thugs, and they'd be walking in a, in a black neighborhood with a lead-filled pipe, and they go up to, to store windows, some of them owned by white corporations, some by black store owners, and they're just smashing them out, boom, boom, boom. And and they're you know they loot they riot they kill now the next day after this or a week or two weeks afterwards what happens to the grandmother who's caring for several of her grandchildren well uh, first of all uh, she's got relatives who used to work in these black communities and their jobs are gone then she she wants to go and she wants to shop for groceries. But now the grocery store has been burned down. She wants to go to the bank, but she can't go to the bank. The bank's been burned down. She wants to get medicine for children who are sick, but the pharmacy has been looted and destroyed. There's nothing left. And the, the destruction that the Democrats unleash in the, in the minority communities lasts for generations, sometimes when, if, if these riots are bad enough, you drive out all of the, uh, all of the uh, intelligentsia, all of the, the hardest workers and so forth. Uh, they all flee black and white and, uh, and the place just spirals down forever. Um, so it, it's, you know, the, the, the Democratic Party, and I don't want to sound too partisan because I'm plenty critical of Republicans, but uh, when it comes to race, they use the race card and they use it violently and they they do not hesitate to destroy black communities in order to uh, to win elections. And that's that's what they do. So this was this was happening. Uh, the the use of these uprisings. Uh, I think it was a coordinated thing. I think to some extent, uh, some of the overreactions with, uh, with the lockdowns of the uh, coronavirus, the shutdown of the economy has been, uh, has been devastating to, to working class Americans. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the wealthy people who are making their livings on, uh, uh, on, uh, uh, computer things they're not the ones suffering but it's the it's the people who were who were bartenders the people who were waiters and waitresses uh, the uh, the women who make beds in in hotels and 
and the, the doorman there and all of those people. It's ordinary working class people who the Democratic Party has just said, we could care less whether these people live or die. We don't care whether their home values are driven to zero. We don't care whether crime just spreads like wildfire in their communities. We want to win elections and nobody is gonna stand in our way. I'm gonna tell you this one, one thing. Uh, if you reflect on what is it that has caused this enormous uh, ongoing coup against Donald Trump, I don't think it's because of his personality or his tweeting. We've had all sorts of presidents in the past. Uh, my personal belief, and certainly there's nothing real official in this, but, but I think uh, that when he signaled that he was going to uh, he was going to normalize relations with Russia. He was going to reduce our reliance on NATO, which is certainly outmoded. He was going to make peace with Syria. He was going to he was going to make peace with Iraq. He was going to withdraw troops from Iran. I think that the deep state, which profits enormously from trillions of dollars funneled through these things. I think they just decided this guy has got to go. And I think that was really the, the uh, motivating factor was the deep state and uh, President Trump's positions on foreign affairs that, uh, that ultimately uh, caused the, uh, the ongoing coup that started even before he was uh, in office. Thank you. So I know that uh, Colonel Black's time with us is limited today. We want to offer an opportunity. We do have some media who are on um, by Zoom. If you have a question that's particularly for uh, Senator Black, please indicate that in the Q&A section of Zoom. Uh, I'd like to pose one that came from some that have come in, and we'll take a question from Marino El Savif after this, and I think that might be what we have time for. If you're media, please send in your questions on the Zoom Q&A right now. Um, Senator Black, this is a question that pulls together your numerous occupations through life, your different roles as a, a, a member of the military, as a holder of a law degree, as a former state delegate and a state senator. There are several avenues being taken right now to try to control the next presidency of the United States. You addressed the potential of, or the, the talk about a military coup, a military involvement in making a decision on that. Um, in Pennsylvania, uh, the Giuliani at this hearing made it very clear that they wanted to move towards a legislative solution to have the legislatures take control over the means of appointing the electors. And in the large filings that Sidney Powell and her colleagues put forward in Michigan and Georgia, for example, there's a judicial remedy uh, being sought. I'd like to ask is if you have any thoughts about how these different aspects of, of the government or I, I know your role in the military is that it should have, of course, absolutely no role. But if you could offer any views about how these different aspects of the government um, come to play here in, in, in coming to a determination on this election. You know, um, the, there's much said about the Electoral College, and usually it's said without a real in-depth understanding of it. Uh, the purpose of the Electoral College was to create a, a uh, consensus among the, the colonies uh, that, uh, uh, or, or rather of, of the states, they were states at the time, but they were states in, under, the, uh, under the early form. And um, uh, the idea was that you would, uh, you would create a situation where the small states would not be forgotten. It was it was a compromise. So uh, you gave uh, you gave the small states uh, a vote for each of their two senators. California has two senators, and Vermont, which is basically two towns and a railroad station, they have two senators. So it balanced them out in that respect. But on the other hand, 
uh, each gets an electoral vote for each congressman, and the congressmen are established by uh, by the uh, uh, population. Now, in the course of doing this, they they essentially compartmentalized each state. Each state has different voting rules, uh, different uh, different standards, different legal standards that are applied, and um, and so one one benefit of this, and I don't know that it's been discussed much, is this compartmentalization, which makes it more difficult to do widespread fraud. Now, in this case, we have what I consider rather obviously coordinated and massive fraud that went across state borders. Um, but uh, uh, typically, it, it is more localized. Now, because it's localized, in some cases, like what we have going on in Pennsylvania, we've got a very serious question about whether the, uh, the vote is valid at all because of the fact that the uh, executive branch uh, appears to have violated the Constitution and, and the requirements for how votes are done, and they decide, well, we've we've got coronavirus, so we're gonna we're gonna just uh, institute a rule without changing the constitution. Well, that's not the way that it's supposed to work. So in Pennsylvania, you had that particular approach, uh, and uh, and that would be a judicial approach. In some states, you may have so much uncertainty uh, that the legislature might just uh, take it out of the hands of the uh, electoral college and say, look, this, this is such a mess that we are going to decide and, and uh, we're going to set up a mechanism to decide. Uh, so you've got all of these different methods and uh, uh, that's, this is what makes it very complex. And it's one of the impediments to having some ultimate decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, back during the, uh, the Bush-Gore race uh, years ago, the Supreme Court was able to focus on the state of Florida, <clears throat> a particular part of Florida, and a question of these, how they voted, the hanging chads and so forth. They actually had physical evidence. It wasn't just numbers run through a computer, uh, which we have now, which I mean, I, I, to, I, to me, there should never be a computer used for an election again. There should never be a mail-in ballot used again, uh, but, uh, uh, but in any event, the Supreme Court in that case, were they were able to make a decision based on a discrete number of facts. Um, this situation, and, and I don't even know that, that there were many allegations of fraud in the, in the Gore-Bush election. I think it was more a question of how, how should things be counted. But in this case, we're talking about hundreds of thousands at the low end and millions at the high end of votes that were stolen. And so it's going to be very awkward for the Supreme Court to come in and sort all that out and to do it in a way that's satisfactory to both Democrats and Republicans. Because if you recall, uh, the Democrats never accepted the Supreme Court's decision uh, in uh, Gore versus Bush. And uh, uh, this, this will be perhaps much more contentious than that one was. Thank you. Um, we will, uh, I know that uh, we're going to come to Marino El Civif in a moment, uh, but this is a period where we do have a chance to take some questions from, from media, so we'll be interspersing those with questions from the panelists. Uh, also, uh, we're opening this up now to all of the, the witnesses uh, that we have. So Bill Binney, 
Harley Schlang or Benny Smith, if he is still on, uh, Colonel Black are all available to answer questions. We'll turn next to Daniel Marmolejo, who runs a popular uh, YouTube program. Uh, Daniel Marmolejo, please turn on your video and pose your question. Or at least posed your question. There we go. Great. Uh, you're muted. P please unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Oh. Oh, I see. Um, not hearing anything in English right now. The interpreter is not hearing anything in Spanish either. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So I think I'm going to uh, let's just wait five more seconds to see if we get it resolved, and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll have to come back. Okay, let's turn to, um, um, we'll, we'll come back to Daniel Marmolejo uh, in a moment. Um, Marina El Savif, would you please uh, pose your question? Uh, muy bien, gracias, Coronel Black. Thank you very much, Colonel Black. At this moment where the deep state, which, which Linda LaRouche used to refer to as the international synergy, interests that are above nation states. Since they have that perspective of, of, and they've tried in the past to carry out a coup d'etat inside the United States um, and to try to do this in the middle of a pandemic, could you, would you anticipate a, an Amer American autumn like the Arab Spring uh, where in the middle of all of these crises which exist, that exist in all of the different United States, of the, the different states of the United States, these uh, murders, these violence, burnings, which are occurring across the American territory, are we perhaps facing that kind of a crisis? And secondly, to just state the second question, do you not believe that the media strategy of the great media that are supporting the government, supporting the, the deep state, or rather the international synergy, the, their line that there are no t proof, that this could be made to backfire uh, on the issue of Smartmatic uh, and, and the Dominion question, which Mr. Schlanger, uh, excuse me, which Benny Smith uh, presented on this fractional uh, counting approach uh, that's being taken on the elections and this ethical violation which has occurred as one of the lawyers referred to in the case of the nevada elections and and the presentations that have been made about this by uh sydney powell well um i you know the the media one one thing that has happened in the background through all of this has been that uh, we have evolved over several years, basically since Trump uh, went in office, uh, into a uh, into a censorship state. Uh, we we often criticize uh, other nations, China, for example, and we say, "Well, look, they're they're uh, they're censoring their equivalent of Twitter." and their their social media and so forth and uh and yet if you watch what has happened over several years uh the uh the social media has become quite draconian and there are many uh many very responsible uh internet news outlets that have simply been shut down there was there was a very fine uh show it was called syria girl Syria girl, uh, she she never cursed. She never used any uh, any photos that were inflammatory. Uh, all of her discussions were factual. They were accurate, 
and uh, but they did not support the terrorists in Syria. And as a result, uh, she was shut down and she was making her living on this. And uh, they basically cut off her living because she was not giving the story that the deep state wanted. Uh, as you know, we have we have supported uh, the terrorist elements in Syria since uh, 2011. We supported them in Libya before that, earlier in 2011. And, um, uh, and yet we always, we talk about the brutality of this and that. And, uh, uh, but uh, then uh, for years and years uh, after the, the war in Syria began, they used to publish just thousands and thousands of pictures of beheadings and crucifixions and all of this, as long as they felt that it was beneficial to undermining the morale of Syria. Then once the morale of Syria was not undermined, they said, we've got to get rid of this. This is terrible stuff. Uh, because now it was simply showing to the public just how, how depraved uh, these people were, how they were enslaving people, they were selling people on on slave markets. These are people that the U.S. has supported through uh, Operation Timber Sycamore, which was the, the original CIA program until it was uh, disclosed. Uh, we, were, we were supplying weapons to ISIS and Al-Qaeda indiscriminately. And uh, uh, so so we, we've seen this transition over time where, uh, where Facebook, Twitter, Google, uh, all of these, uh, YouTube, they have all tightened and tightened and tightened the screws. I did some videos, with very factual, not inflammatory in any way, uh, but they dealt with the situation in Syria. And uh, someone went back to refer to one that was four years, four years ago. It's not as though people are looking at them every day. And he discovered that they have uh, they have deleted it. They've just censored it because not because it's false, but because it's true and because it does not meet the narrative of the Central Intelligence Agency. And so you have this purging of history. History has to be eliminated. You see the same thing with the riots going on, the tearing down of statues. Um, they started with Confederate statues. They were the easy target. Then they went to uh, they went to Christopher Columbus. They started tearing his down. There was uh, there was one of the uh, one of the the gang of four Democrat uh, female congressmen, the very radical group uh, headed by AOC. And the, the one said, we need to tear down that statue of the Catholic priest who voluntarily joined a leper colony, knowing that he would be infected by leprosy, knowing that his, his digits would fall from his body, that he would die this horrific death. And yet he, he did it voluntarily so that he could serve the needs of that community and he could preach the gospel. And so they have basically it is anyone who stands for decency and honor uh, and uh, and civilization. We're going to destroy it. This is the same thing I saw when I was in when I was in Syria and uh, I went to Palmyra, this wonderful uh, city, this historic city. And ISIS had gone in and they had destroyed and burned and, and looted uh, all of the historical monuments. Some of them, some of these went back 4,000 years before the birth of Christ. And um, so anywhere that you see revolutionaries, you're going to see an attempt to purge records of civilized activities. And we're seeing that in this country. Now, I will say that when going back to the idea of autumn, I think what I, I think that we're not quite to the point 
where they can pull off an, an Arab Spring type thing in the United States. There's a little too much resistance, a little too much left of our, our cultural architecture that uh, has not yet been dismantled and destroyed. But they're making progress all the time. And uh, if they're allowed to continue, particularly if they should prevail in this election and can go on, uh, they will eventually try to simply disassemble the country uh, and, and, and its culture completely. There is a there is a communist, a Bolshevik underpinning to the whole thing. Uh, it has the, the whiff of the French Revolution and that type of thing. And uh, that is ultimately where they are headed. Thank you very much, Colonel Black. Thank you for your time you were able to spend with us today. Uh, we know you have another engagement to attend to, and we'd like to, to thank you. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed being with you, and, and thank you for putting this on. It's, uh, it's very timely and necessary. Thank you. I know that uh, I know that Harley Schlanger would also like to respond to that question. And then um, just in terms of the agenda, we're then going to hear from Leah Hoops, who is a Republican Party committee woman in Pennsylvania, who was a poll watcher and present at the counting center on election day in Pennsylvania for some uh, some for, uh, firsthand account from her. So and then we'll turn to Daniel Marmelado for his question to all of these witnesses. So uh, Harley, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to answer the, the last two questions. You know, what, what we're talking about here is a criminal conspiracy that's been underway for four years to get rid of Donald Trump. Uh, those involved in it are identifiable. The methods they've used have been exposed. The Russiagate story, the Ukraine impeachment, and so on. All of that is now out in the open. Now, those who are doing this would use Biden to impose policies that will put us on the course toward a World War III in very short order. Biden is a war hawk from way back. He's committed to a, a global banker's dictatorship, which is being organized now by the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the International Monetary Fund, and others. Besides the pandemic, we're facing global food insecurity, which is leading to millions of people dying of starvation. So this vote fraud took place in a context that I tried to present in, in my presentation to make clear that this was something that was organized by people who could do it on behalf of policies that are anti-American, anti-human, and go against the interests of everyone on the planet. Now, then you get to the question of what is the legal basis for overturning an election? And what has been put together so far demonstrates that this network, this group of oligarchs who have generally done whatever they wanted to do in the past and who are now trying to finish off the regime change coup against Donald Trump, they carried out fraud on a massive scale. There are several specific cases where this fraud can be addressed. And we, we went through that, uh, for example, in Georgia, Ballots were signatures where signatures were not verified. Those, those have to be tossed. Dead votes, people who changed their address, where there was no mail-in mail ballot requested. According to these figures, there are 130 something thousand of those. So there's no question that there has to be a full recount in Georgia with all those ballots that are no good thrown out. Just as in Florida in 2000, when they couldn't determine whether a vote was punched or not, they threw out the ballot. Well, that's what we have in Georgia. Uh, you have a similar thing in, in Arizona, similar in, in uh, Wisconsin, uh, where you need a full recount. Now, furthermore, let's, let's go one step further, because we're not just talking about an outcome of an election. We're talking about the future of the human race. It's incumbent upon President Trump now to use the time where he's still in office. Now, that's assuming that we don't overturn the vote fraud, but I think we have to. But he has things he can do. He's already cleaning out the Defense Department of the War Hawks. He's got to go further. He's got to insist that if Barr will not release the documents, the fully redacted documents, the public documents, 
that show the fraud committed, the criminal conspiracy underway. He's got to get an attorney general who will do that. There has to be a full disclosure of all these things, including getting into the files of the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA, where you might be able to determine that fraud was carried out. And I, I'd like to just ask Bill, if, if backdoors were used in computers as part of the fraud, is that something that's traceable? The answer is yes. In fact, uh, that coordinated shutdown should be traceable in all the data that's already collected and stored by NSA also. The FBI has direct access to that data and they can find it if they want to, if they have the will to go find it. That's the problem. In the intelligence community, they don't want to find this information because they want this regime changed. They've been at the well, so heart of this uh, conspiracy against the president for a long time, even before he became president. And it's really up to the people now to demand that President Trump go ahead with a full disclosure, full yep. release of documents. And, and I proposed a couple of weeks ago, now's the time to bring back Edward Snowden to yeah. pardon Julian Assange. Let's get uh, everything yeah. out of Snowden. Because There's a real all of it. Here, Marley. There's another problem, though. He, the president can order, as you've already seen, he can order the declassification of things. But if, if somebody like the head of the CIA doesn't want to do it, they, they just slow roll him. They, they just simply don't follow the order. Or they, or they make an excuse saying, well, we're still searching for all this data, you know, or something like that. They make up excuses just to slow roll and ignore the president's order. So he has to have somebody inside those agency who will actually follow his orders. And right now, I don't think he does. Great. Donald Trump made his name partly in The Apprentice with the words, you're fired. He's got <laughs> to remember that in a haspel when it comes to the <laughs> Maybe to, to Bill Barr as well. And yep. just as he found Rick Grinnell to break the logjam as the director of national intelligence, maybe he can find someone who can go in and find those documents, release them, and get them out there. But you see, this is, it's not, an, as you know, it's not an academic question. It's a question of whether we're going to lose this country once and for all, which goes back to the right. question that was posed. And that's why. I think what we've presented and, and what's in the Sidney Powell documents, what's been presented overall, is enough of an indication that we have to go all out to get it all out into the open before December 14th. And if it's not done by then, then you postpone the Electoral College. The state legislatures have an ability to do that. So yeah. it requires decisive action. The decisive action in terms of the, the people who are facing starvation in Africa, the people who have no medical care around the world, the people who will be thrown out of their homes uh, by evictions, mass wave of evictions coming up this winter. This is what's at stake. And instead of splitting hairs over, you know, was this person dead? Should, should that vote be counted? Obviously, it shouldn't be counted. Throw them out. Get a recount, a full recount, taking into consideration what Sidney Powell has put forward. That's right. Got I'm got to interrupt. So we've, we're going to hear now from, um, we have two people on the ground from Pennsylvania, uh, Leah Hoops, a committee woman, Republican committee woman, and then also Senator Mario Scavello. So we'll hear uh, quickly from uh, Leah Hoops and then Senator Scavello. Um, please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, it's an honor to, uh, to be here. I was actually quite shocked to be asked um, to be on this panel. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, this by no means has been an easy thing. Um, I've been inundated with phone calls about getting my story out. Um, and um, and on, quite honestly, my safety is at risk when I talk about these things, which is a very sad place to, to think about that, that that's where we are in the United States of America is that I have to fear for my safety to talk about the truth. Um, so I just want to give you just a quick brief um, uh, history. Um, I became a committee woman. Um, I also started a watchdog uh, group and became involved with the Thomas More Society. Um, and we've basically been, we're just an unincorporated association of, of concerned citizens who have been paying attention to our newly um, uh, uh, elected completely Democrat County Council uh, and election board. So from the start of election day from 7 a.m., it was 
I, it was just, a, it was a disgrace. It, it really was. Uh, we had issues with our scanners from the very beginning. Uh, one of our scanners didn't work at all. The other one, um, it would take four or five times for a ballot to go through. Uh, we actually couldn't get a hold of our county um, to rectify the situation for hours. And then by the time that someone came in, it was the voting machine warehouse supervisor, who also happens to be a Bernie Sanders delegate, who is a complete radical, um, came in, did not rectify the situation, and just told us that the ballots and their barcodes were deformed. Uh, so an hour goes by, and then they bring in about 500 more of stack of new ballots. Um, so that was just the beginning. Um, there was complete confusion. Um, you know, we had our Supreme Court or Pennsylvania or uh, Supreme Court, you know, make election laws and extended for three days. It just caused mass confusion for, for a very long time. Um, as to what I saw at the counting center, um, I had, I guess you would say, recruited um, some <clears throat> ex-military people to, uh, to become poll watchers. Um, and specifically one gentleman who had also testified at the Pennsylvania uh, Senate hearing. Um, he is a data forensic scientist and it, um, he was a naval commander. Um, he's very, um, very experienced in fraud. Um, so once he got to the counting center on election night, he had called me and said that there is a back room in which there was no observation um, and nobody was allowed back there. There was much resistance um, for the, from the people that were there. So when he called me, I had contacted the Thomas More Society in order for us to get a lawyer down there. Um, and then what ended up happening was we got an injunction and it took about two and a half days to actually get into that back room. Once we got back there, um, the injunction was actually a joke to be quite honest, because it allowed five, five minutes every two hours. Um, and I mean, we, we were set 20 feet back from, you couldn't even see a physical ballot. So it was, it was um, they were like giving crumbs to the peasants. I mean, it was just, it was atrocious. Um, what I did see that day, and, and just to, to give a bit of a positivity, is that Republicans and Democrat observers, we were all in agreement that there was something wrong with the fact that we were not allowed back into that room where pre-canvassing was transpiring. Um, and so by the time we finally got back there, uh, Greg had gotten into another room, which was, uh, it was a sealed off room where they were, um, where they were keeping the ballots. And this was two days after election night. So what he had, what he had seen was um, anywhere between, I think it was like 50 to 70,000 ballots that were unopened, uh, despite that the count had already happened. Um, there's a multitude of other issues that had transpired between uh, missing logs um, that they were trying to um, back, like kind of fill in information two weeks after the election happened. You had, uh, you had V drives that were missing from the scanners that they were trying to collect. You had, I mean, absent chain of custody. Um, you know, you, there was zero transparency, resistance. Um, and then to top it all off, uh, the, the Attorney General Josh Shapiro sent two special agents to uh, Greg's house, to my house and other observers, uh, completely unannounced um, in the middle of the day and, uh, it was quite concerning. I didn't know if I was being investigated as the criminal or for someone who had already signed an affidavit um, into what I had witnessed. Um, it was quite intimidating. So hopefully that kind of clears things up for everybody. Mm. It's been insane to, to say the least. Um, I'm quite disgusted at, at what, I, what, what I've witnessed. Mm. Thank you. And, and you, uh, you were one of the people who testified at the hearing on, on Gettysburg, in Gettysburg on Wednesday, is that right? Yes, it was, it was actually quite an honor. Um, it was, I, it, this is very surreal to me, um, all that, that's transpiring. But to me, like I said in my testimony, um, you know, it's not about party, it's about my country. Mm. And, um, and, I, and I, I quoted Rush Limbaugh and how he speaks about, you know, where are the grassroots efforts? And I feel like this is this is um, this is a movement, and it's not going to be stopped because the republic is uh, we're angry, and and we want to fight for our country, and and you have to fight for what is right, 
And um, that's why I stepped up and that's why I'm speaking up. And um, that's the only way that we're going to get this done. It, you know, I, we're screaming from the rooftops that we're angry and, and it's going to get to the point where we're going to force them to do something. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. No problem. Uh, we, our uh, next uh, witness that we're going to hear from is Senator Mario Scavello. He serves as state senator in Pennsylvania's 40th Senate District, and before that, he served for more than a decade in the House of Representatives in the 177th Legislative District. He is the chair of the Senate Banking and Insurance Committee there, serves on many other committees, and I believe is uh, one of the co-sponsors of the joint resolution that's been introduced into the state Senate and state House uh, to take back control over the appointment of the electors. Senator Scavello, uh, please go ahead. Oh, um, I, I believe you're muted, Senator. Could you check your microphone? Okay. Great, okay, you thank you. I'm, good. I'm fine now, okay. By the way, glad to be here. Leah was spied on with what she said. Uh, he had numerous testifiers and it was really an eye opener. But you know, when she said voting machines, I think it's so important to, to realize this because this thing was planned. How does a governor decertify every voting machine in the state and forces these machines on every county? When the counties balked about it, what ended up happening was the, um, they didn't want to pay for them. So. Then the governor comes to us and we didn't, we, we said, we don't have a problem with those machines. So it took, it took, a, uh, he had to basically borrow money from an account to pay for the machines. And these are machines that some, and he said that the machines had to give a receipt. Well, I know many machines, especially in the Southeast, when you vote, you get a receipt exactly what you voted for. These machines don't give you a receipt. Um, just start there. And then on, on uh, the day after the election, a statewide official and a U.S. Uh, senator say that on the day, the morning after the election, that Biden won. Now, how they must have a crystal ball or something, because there was nothing, you know, there's no way when we, there was like a seven, eight point difference going into it, that Trump was up. So uh, the, other, the other piece is, how does uh, Philly, when Philly finishes is basically when Pittsburgh started. They held off until, Pittsburgh held off until Philly had their numbers. And, and if you really look at down ballots, this is the first time since 1956 that the Republicans won the Treasury and won the Auditor General's race, 1956. So if the, if the president, if Biden wins and, and uh, the Attorney General wins by a pretty close, about the same margins, what happened to the down ballot? Were those ballots just two people and put in? And I, I'm assuming that that must have happened. And how do we get more ballots returned than sent out? That's, a, that's the real scary one. How do we get more ballots returned than sent out? Um, you know, I'm with Doug, and I, I think that uh, we need to get to the bottom of this. And this is just what, uh, you know, starting with those machines, you knew there was a problem. Why? And I believe some other states did the same thing. There was, a, there was a Democratic governor's meeting, about a handful of, they met with, uh, uh, they met with the uh, Speaker of the House and a couple others out west somewhere, it was La La Las Vegas, I'm not sure where, about a year, over about over a year ago. And I believe this is where all this started. And uh, it, you know, I, I hope at some point the FBI, CIA, somebody needs to investigate this because they just don't do everything together, which they have here. And um, my, my governor has been spending a lot of time in Delaware prior to uh, Biden winning and now is continuing to spend more time in Delaware because we don't see him in the state. I have a wolf watch on my Facebook. Where is the governor? He's not in the Capitol. I'd, I'd gladly take any questions if you have any. Wonderful. 
Um, we have a, some, a panel of a few other people who are here asking questions. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to bring them on. Um, raise your sure. hand. Okay, so yeah, uh, David Meiswinkle, he's an attorney hey, in New Jersey. Uh, and then uh, Juan Francisco Soto, if you have time to take two questions. Let's keep them sure. keep brief right. if we can. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, Senator, uh, thank you very much. I uh, was uh, curious as to the uh, voting machines that you just uh, had installed in Pennsylvania. Is this the first election for those, vo those voting machines that you didn't need? I should have said that, you're right. Now you're going to use them in a presidential, a new machine used for the first time in a presidential. Think about that. It smells, doesn't it? Right. Thank you. Exactly what happened. And then I think we had a question from one Juan Francisco Soto. Yes, I wanted to ask, what is the, the state agency responsible for administering the elections what's is there some electoral leadership is there some agency that is responsible for implementing uh and for for certifying and taking custody of the machines under the existing state law translate his translator back i believe he's talking about the electoral college and, and what what happens what's the pot what's the procedure um the oh, electoral I'm, I'm college sorry. I can repeat his question. I, there is a, no, me the, estaba refiriendo hacia no, no, I'll, I'll that's not what it. I was it's asking. Okay. Hold on. It, 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 because of a Zoom issue, if you repeat it, it won't help. Okay. Um, the question was about what the, how the underneath, under state law, um, who is in charge of the electoral process, who would be in charge of taking a look at these machines, uh, inspecting them, uh, how does that process work? I believe that was the, the tenor of the question. Well, it's a great question. This is the first time something like this has ever happened. And I don't think anybody was ever prepared for it. Maybe we should have, uh, when, when, the, when he came up with buying these machines and forcing counties to buy them, we should have looked into it. But uh, uh, I, I believe what we're doing on Monday is some way that we can, what we're trying to do Monday. Uh, I know that we have these signatures uh, on, the, on, the, on the petition, Doug's petition, hopefully, um, that can stop things and get someone to look at this very closely. And I, I believe it's going to take a vote in the, in the House of Representatives and a vote in the Senate. It's, and that's where, that's where we're going to be at. And if that happens, then it would be, uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that day because I want to see the challenges coming in from the other side. <laughs> So that's that's uh, so on on Monday is when you plan to move through both the House and the Senate the the joint resolution is that I, the idea? I that's what Doug said. I'm not sure can it can be Monday, but this is something that we're you know um, I'm gonna have to contact Doug because he I I co-sponsored the the resolution, but Doug is leading the charge. Um, as soon as we hear anything, we'll um, we'll uh, move on it. But that's hmm. I'm uh, I'm hopeful that that would be the case, but. Uh, until the, the, we have to hear from the leaders, and that's basically where it comes. Right. Um, do you have time for one more quick question? Go ahead. Go right ahead. I, was, I was just wondering if you, because there's been a, um, Jenna Ellis and, and Giuliani had been announcing that this is you know, more and more the direction that the, the Trump legal challenge is taking is going directly to state legislatures. Do you know if there are moves similar to what's going on in Pennsylvania in either uh, Arizona or Michigan, which also have Republican legislatures? I'm hearing that since we had that hearing on on um, on Wednesday, that there is talk that others other states are following following suit. So if that's the case, I I believe yeah, it might very well go that route. Great. Then any other? Is it, does anyone else have a question for the senator? If you have if you have the time. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh uh, Senator, I, I watched the hearings in, in uh, Pennsylvania, and I was born in Pennsylvania, so I was really, I mean, I was happy as anything when I saw the patriotic fervor. I just wanted to, to just to mention the, uh, I guess it was the Colonel Mestriani, is that his? Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. the, uh, sort of leading the charge. Maybe uh, just give us a little bit of insight into uh, that panel. And, and what's at stake? What you see is at stake in this election for the country and for the world? I think Leah said it very well. You know, this is, the, regardless of uh, if, um, 
if we're successful or not, we need to uh, really let people know what went on and um, make sure that something like this never happens again. So that's the importance of it. Um, I'm hopeful that we're successful, but if we're not, then um, my concern is that this never happens in the future and we have to take steps to make sure that that's, the, that's what's going to happen. Great. Thank you very much, Senator. My pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, it, uh, we'll, we'll turn now to uh, the question that we were trying to get earlier from our media. Here we go. Uh, Daniel Marmalejo, go ahead. Hi, I want to give you my, all my greetings to everyone who is participating in this extremely important event, which allows us to analyze the, the elections in the country, which has uh, tried to take democracy to the whole world. What happens in the United States, we know this in, in the United States, we lived through this in Mexico in 2006 to some degree because we had a spurious president who took us to one of the most biggest terrible internal conflicts, uh, uh, redoubling of violence and a whole series of uh, relations with the deep state in the United States, with the military industrial complex and with the international drug trade. Recently, we have uh, received in Mexico the return of a very important military man from the last government, which is General Cienfuegos, who uh, they say is connected to organized crime and most surely with the uh, U.S. deep state. Uh, he has the same charges against him as Genaro Garcia Luna, who is a personality of the spurious government of Felipe Calderon. Based on the evidence which has been presented here, the parallel is really very, very similar. Um, there are some years of difference, but what concerns me greatly are the statements which uh, Colonel Black has stated here with regard of a uh, military grouping in the United States that could possibly carry out a coup d'etat. Uh, uh, different leaders and in fact the president like Evo Morales in Bolivia, that if the in the United States there's not a danger of a coup, it's because there's no U.S. embassy in the United States. Uh, I would also like to express my solidarity and that of the people of Mexico uh, for Leah Hopes and uh, for the situation she's having to endure. What I want to know is if there is uh, there is within the American population to achieve this, to find something along the lines of universal truth. And if justice in the United States, the justice system could be an example, not only for the United States, but for the world, so that they would be able to actually uh, look into all of the details to make sure that this is a judicially viable uh, uh, election to make sure they would not have a spurious president as we did in Mexico. This is directed to anyone who would care to respond. Go, uh, go ahead, Harley. No, that's Please. a very important point. I, I think it's interesting that the Mexican president has withheld the endorsement of Joe Biden or the recognition of Joe Biden because of what he faced in 2006 with vote fraud. And the, the question that you are posing to us is really, how do you restore the tradition of the American system, of the American Republic, at a point when the direction of the country is spiraling into a worse and worse economic crisis, a social crisis, and the group that's trying to come to power through this vote fraud is committed to expanding the wars around the world, expanding the uh, financial fraud, the outsourcing, the, the uh, collapse of industry. Uh, so it really is a, a moment where everyone has to take a, a very deep reflection as to what we've been tolerating from governments and the stealing of the right to vote the right to have your vote count is one of the important things. It's considered one of the sacred things about the United States, but this has not been addressed. Now, that's why what, what uh, I just spoke about a few moments ago, I think, is really the direction we have to go in. We have to have a full and open reckoning with what's been done to the country. And this could have been done 
uh, beginning four years ago, had there not been so much obstruction from the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, the, the Bush networks, the media, you know, we ran head up, President Trump ran head up against the, the so-called deep state. Now, it's not really just a deep state. It's what Mrs. LaRouche refers to as the British Empire. And this is what Lyndon LaRouche always identified as the enemy, where an oligarchy attempts to impose itself on the institutions of self-government. And in particular today, that means destroying sovereign institutions. So I think what we just heard from the senator in Pennsylvania uh, is quite interesting because the idea that the people will take back the government acting through their local representatives, elected representatives, uh, restores can restore confidence. Most people in the United States have no confidence that we'll get honesty from the Congress. But we do know there are people, the whistleblowers like Bill Binney and others, there are good people in this country that have to step forward and fight this. And, you know, it's not a question of waiting to see what's going to happen next week in the court. People have to be mobilizing. And by mobilizing, I mean, get out the truth. And the truth is not limited to the vote fraud fight. It's the question of how we've given up our rights for self-government to the extent that we've stood back and allowed this to happen. Look, the, the Bush administration was a murderous administration. Obama was worse. And what we're seeing so far from Biden, if he's allowed in, it will be even worse at a point where the whole world is careening toward a systemic collapse. So what we're discussing here is not some abstract question of, of legal judgments or academic concerns, but something that really should touch every single person who's hearing this and mobilize for an outcome which includes the cleaning up of, of this uh, gang of criminals that have been have taken over the United States. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Harley. Um, I'd like to. Thank you so much. I'd like to turn back to one of our earlier witnesses, who I believe is uh, still on with us here, uh, Benny Smith. If you're still on, I was wondering if you had anything that you'd like to add in response to uh, what we just heard from our Pennsylvania uh, witnesses, Leah Hoops and, and Senator uh, Scavino, Scavello. Yes, um, um, for, for both of the, the people in Pennsylvania, I would go for ballot images. When uh, voters cast votes in these new machines, uh, the paper is usually passed through a scanner and that scanner immediately creates an auditable record called a ballot image. It's, it's basically a selfie. Uh, and contrary to what people understand about this technology is they are actually the ballots at that point. The scanners, uh, the tabulators don't count the paper. They actually count the images and they create these auditable records. They create a cast vote record. They also create a digital copy and uh, you can, I, I guess parliamentary procedure would, would allow for the legislature to ask for those images. And basically it's every single ballot that ever went through a scanner. And from the, the places that they're using Dominion, they have this audit mark where there's, there's basically an accounting exercise that happens with, it's, it's basically inventory. And the serial numbers on those are gonna be like money. So if you have a dump of ballots, you're gonna have a bunch of sequential numbers in the way that you would see money. Um, the problem that has happened from, from every place that I've been advocating for election transparency is they don't want to give those images up. And there's, there's Audit USA. Uh, there's a group that started this ballot image project after I did Fraction Magic. The one thing that I learned that I could not uh, affect the election with when I was playing with the, the election weights was I couldn't play around with it with the images. So that is something that, that this organization has literally gone state by state suing for. Uh, most times they get rejected for those, and there, there's a, probably a really uh, good reason why somebody wouldn't want you to see that. But those are actually, those should be public records. In federal elections, any record that is created in association or connection to the election must be preserved for 22 months. So that's, a, that's prima facie evidence. And it's something that every, every uh, legislative body or every election body should be going for. They are called ballot images. 
it is illegal to destroy them. <laughs> some, some uh, I think the default settings are for those images to be turned on because that's how the tabulators get the records that they create. Uh, but certain organizations or certain uh, electoral uh, uh, communities are turning those off. So I would definitely uh, push, especially since the legislature is looking at it, to push to make those uh, disclosable and public because they are committed basically on election night. Whenever that, when you, whenever you start getting totals, those are coming from those actual images. And that's a, that's a really widely unknown secret uh, in the adjudication process. Uh, when, 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 when uh, the electoral, uh, the, 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 I guess there would be poll watchers or the the employees of the of the election are are doing the adjudication. If something's set aside and they have to interpret if the bubble is filled in or if it's an overvote or it's an undervote, those are like TIFF files. They're images that come up in the at, at the Dominion's is called audit suite or audit mark. It's an audit suite and it's bringing up all those images. But there are some significant pieces of information that you can glean from those. You can technically recount the entire election yourself. And if it's a hand mark solution like an absentee ballot, you know, I've been coloring outside of my line, outside of the lines my whole life. Those, those bubbles are going to uh, be very specific. And this high definition image is going to take that. You can see the ink density. You can see uh, the, the variation of how somebody has filled out the ballot. And that's like a fingerprint. But if you have a whole bunch of circles filled in completely uh, perfectly, then that would suggest that something uh, happened from like a print source. So if it's a hand, uh, absentee and you see a whole bunch like their 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 comments where people are saying that they're filling in the top race and down ballot is is completely blank but well, that sounds like ma like mass printing to me so i would be looking for the inventory of the serial numbers that get created for those ballots plus the the um the ink density of of those scans on those images that is a that is a lot of evidence uh that you know i i, I really rarely look for confidence in elections because uh, I write computer programs, I'm looking for evidence. I know that those images are evidence. Hmm. Do you think that that's the sort of thing that should be made publicly available after every election? I mean, if they have the data, should that be posted by counties or precincts along with the results, do you think? Absolutely. I think those should be posted on election night because what you'll find, Dane County, Wisconsin used to do it. I think, I, I think they still publish them, but not directly on election night, what should happen? And this is an accounting exercise. You should commit the data to the record on election night. And you can drop a bunch of CPAs in or whoever you want to, and they can figure out how to get from one total to another. But it's all documented and it's on the record. And if, you know, the computer's job is to count, and, and most times they don't, they don't even do that right, uh, having these images will allow people in precincts to recount the election themselves. So you don't have to, there's, there's something that's always in conflict, right? You have you, you, these two Ps that just fight with each other and that's public dollars and public information uh, backed up by proprietary software. So the public is paying for uh, these, this election equipment. And when we want to see or adjudicate or, or, or look at what we pay for with these public dollars, then we are met with proprietary software and proprietary hardware. And we're told we're not, able to see this. And this is the this is the primary defect in elections that are conducted by computers by private companies uh, is the fact that they they hold the right to say that that this information is private. However, these images are not a part of that. These are these are these are not these are not private. They, the best best way to say it is the images are the ballot. Yes, I know that there's paper and that is something that you can see um, based on inspection, those should be written in the public records uh, laws that all your open, open records should say that a, a, a registered voter can go and ask for that. But then you can put all the images on a thumb drive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The um, Yes, I was going to say, just in terms of our scheduling, uh, this event was supposed to end now. Clearly, there's a lot more to say. So I think we should keep going. I do want to ask if any of our uh, our panel of, uh, of legal experts, if you do need to go at a certain time um, to please make sure to offer your reflections um, before you go and raise your hand if you do need to get going. Uh, yes, let's go. Uh, Simon Levy, go ahead. Thank you. There is uh, one more question for all the all the panelists um just considering that there is a 
among all the lawsuits of uh, that Trump uh, uh, on the procedure, there is among like 40 lawsuits. My question is regarding most, more, more, all the 40 lawsuits, they were heard by Republican uh, uh, judges. An example, Pennsylvania, the third U.S. Court of Appeals denied. Uh, the U.S. District Court in the Eastern District dismissed. There are there different kind of uh, another lawsuits that they were withdrawn. So my question is, if we had the ev the evidence that just we we heard last minutes about the pictures and about the technology and about this kind of uh, crook situation. Why the why the the judges they deny or withdraw these uh, these amount of uh, statement proofs and material? Can we consider that is not merely a situation bet between the the Republicans or Democrat or the, the Dem Democratic uh, Party? Can we consider that there is a big crisis among all the a democratic system in U.S. Hmm. Exactly right. Yeah, I would say absolutely because that even goes back to the when they started spying on everybody in the United States and everybody in the world. That was the whole idea. Now the whole thing is to subvert and control the population of the uh, United States and the world. So uh, you know, I, I, this is just a continuation of it in a different domain. That's all. Okay. Thank you. I, I would like to say something on that also, because we're ultimately looking at this as a strictly legal question. You know, what will a judge do? And very often judges look for the way out, the easiest way out, and just say, well, you haven't proved that the election should be overturned, that there was enough fraud. Whereas an honest judge would, would say, let's look into this further. We saw this with the cases of, of Russiagate against uh, uh, General Flynn and against Roger Stone where there was no evidence. They, they admitted afterwards that there was no evidence. In fact, the evidence that they presented was a fraud. So why did the judges go along with that? Why is a judge, until, re until Trump pardoned Flynn, why were they still trying to keep Flynn uh, under control of the Judge Sullivan? So we do have a profound crisis in the country. And part of it is there are very few people who have the guts to stand up and take on power. Uh, you look in the Congress, you know, President Trump, when he tried to initially withdraw troops from Syria, both parties voted against him and said, we have to keep the troops there. So we, we have a, a, an absolutely profound crisis in the United States, but it's also worldwide because the system we live in is collapsing. The financial system is collapsing. The, the goods production is collapsing. Uh, and the so-called deep state is targeting the countries that aren't collapsing, like China. So, you know, I think there's a profound need for a certain amount of courage, education, and, you know, we, we need more people who are whistleblowers who will stand up and tell the truth. And then we need a population that responds to that. And what we saw from the two people from Pennsylvania is that they are responding. And I, I just wanna go back to this point about the state legislatures. The constitution does give the state legislatures a certain amount of power in determining the outcome of elections. And the state legislatures tend to be more close to the, the voters than the Congress. You go to Washington and you get separated from your constituents. But as you can see from, from what the Senator just said, he's hearing from his constituents. There, uh, Senator uh, Mastriano said this in the Wednesday hearing. People are approaching him when he's out walking his dog. They're asking him what's going on. That's the level on which we can win this fight because the Constitution does give to the legislatures the ultimate determination as to who are selected as electors to cast the vote for president on December 14th. So I, I think that's, that's an important way to look at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on that, let me just read that relevant part of the Constitution since it's been coming up. Um, it says, The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. 
He shall hold his office during the term of four years and, together with the vice president chosen for the same term, be elected as follows. Each state shall appoint, in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct, a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. So because it says here that the state will appoint it, uh, the electors in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct. This is actually, in the early days, this is how some states did it. Um, South Carolina chose its electors legislatively, directly, until uh, sometime, until after the Civil War. So up through the 18, up through 1860, that's how that state was still doing it. And this is the basis uh, for what these state senators and representatives uh, around the country are moving for and what the Trump campaign is calling for. That's the, that's the basis on that. Okay, let's uh, see if we have uh, any other questions from our panelists. We're going to do about another, let's say about 10 minutes uh, uh, of questions, and then we're going to hear final thoughts from our uh, legal experts and uh, then we'll conclude the, the program for today. So, any other questions? Okay, well, maybe we'll go ahead and move to our wrap-up phase. I'd just first like to ask our, our witnesses, um, Bill Binney, Harley Schlanger, and I believe we also have Leah Hoops and Benny Smith. You're welcome if you would like to add anything else um, to do so. No obligation. Would, would you like to add anything else to what you've said so far today? Um, yeah, I, I really would like to just, since I'm given the opportunity, um, I think it's important, um, especially now for, um, for things like this to happen, um, as, as often as possible and to be able to, to push out this message and for more people to, to step up. And this is actually very refreshing to, to have these conversations and, and listen to everybody because, um, you know, the truth is being suppressed. Um, I, I'm very fearful that at this point in, in our country, um, that the propaganda has taken over, um, and, you know, you have a bunch of, uh, Americans who are very comfortable in their ignorance, um, who are afraid to speak up or, you know, they just don't understand, um, what their freedoms are. They don't, you know, they don't feel that they have a right to speak up or, or whatever it may be, but, um, I truly feel like at, just at this point, we are, we are on the precipice of, of a revolution. Um, and I, I'm, I'm happy to be on the right side of that. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that this message that you guys have today really gets pushed out as much as possible because it's, um, it's, it's super important. Um, it, it's not happening enough. It really isn't. And I feel bad. I truly feel bad for, um, uh, for the upcoming generation who are just completely lost and are being indoctrinated um, by these left wing, um, you know, institutions. And, uh, it, you know, something as simple as uh, public education in the sense of, um, you know, only 31 states have one year requirement for, you know, civics, 10 states have half a year requirement and nine states have no requirement whatsoever. Um, you know, how do you know that you're losing your freedoms if, if you're not educated into what they are? So um, I, I think there's there's so many angles that we need, really need to attack this. And I, and I think it's, it's not going to come. It's not going to come down to our legislation. It's going to come down to the people. Um, so thank you for letting me ramble. But um, this has been more than refreshing to, to speak to to all of you and feel like I, you know, I'm, I'm normal. And you know what I'm seeing is not a theory; it's it's very real. Um, so um, yeah, I'm I'm excited for for what's coming up. Anxious and excited. So thank you again, and uh, I, I just say God bless America and 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 for everybody else across the world on this panel. Thank you for the support. It it means a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jason. If I can just add my final piece. Uh, we're going to have another one of these forums, uh, actually a two-day conference, December 12th and 13th, on the post-election, what, what the world is going to look like, what's needed, where we're going to look at the various issues we're discussing. Today, we'll have one panel on the election and what's happening. Uh, 
uh, another panel on, on uh, global economics, what, what has to be done to take power back to sovereign nation states and uh, develop cooperative policies to deal with things such as pandemics, such as the famine. Uh, and we'll have a cultural panel. It's up on the screen now, but December 12th and 13th. And if you're excited by this discussion, as I can see you are, get your friends to get involved in it. We really need to have this kind of ongoing challenge to our axioms, to, to break through the groupthink that dominates most uh, society and to really have people step forward and, and uh, get access to their creative potential, which means to be a citizen of the world as well as a patriot of your country. That's the uh, tradition of the Schiller Institute taken from Friedrich Schiller. Uh, there's no distinction between being a patriot and a world citizen. In fact, the only way you can really truly be a patriot is to act so that your actions will improve the conditions around the world so that other countries will wish to have good relationships with you. So join us on the 12th and 13th. Great. Thank you, Harley. Thank you, Leah. Um, Benny Smith, would you like to add anything else? Then we'll go to Bill Binney and then our, our legal experts. Yes. Um, thank you guys for having me. Um, at heart, I'm a voter. Uh, second, I'm an election commissioner. I'm a Democrat election commissioner uh, who takes my oath very seriously. Um, we have to get back to policing our republic. And if I would just say it best as a voter, we, what I value most is the postmortem. When a candidate loses, they have to reassess, they have to figure out what happened, what they didn't do right, who they didn't reach, and they retool and they come back and they offer a better solution to which would be me, the voter at the end. Um, but if we can't pursue authenticatable results, then we don't actually know if someone won or lost, then there can be no postmortem. And then the process can't get any better. We can't get any better solutions. They say if banks compete, you win. But if we don't know who our competitors are and they don't know if they lost or not, then they can never retool. And that's going to end up being something very destabilizing in the region. And it's a destructive process when, you, when we don't allow those people uh, to know that they've pursued. You know, you can respect somebody who you lost to, right? But the, the thing that we see now is it's a large unknown, and that's problematic. That's destructive for the republic. I'm not trying to, to, to get a Republican seated or unseated. I'm trying to preserve the republic. Uh, and I think that's what we should get back to. I think that's something that, that is barely germane in a lot of these topics. There's a lot of potter, partisan posturing, but this should be the most nonpartisan piece of the electoral process. Mm. Thank you. Bill Binney, would you like to add anything? Well, yeah, I just like to I just like to say that I think this is a really a crisis, the most serious crisis point in our country since our civil war. I mean, it, it, we've never faced such a such a level of corruption and and uh, and uh, subversion of our of our processes as a republic. If we don't address this and hold people accountable who have been involved with this and actually do something about it, and I look to Barr and Durham to do it, and they seem to be failing it. Uh, why? You know, this is only going to get worse and we're going to lose our republic totally. I mean, we're sliding down that path of totalitarianism. I saw this start in 2001 and it's only gotten worse since then. So America, we got to stand up and oppose it, period. Great. Okay, well, that I think will close out our testimony from our witnesses. So we'll switch over and uh, hear our reflections from our legal experts from around the world. So who would like to start mm -hmm. off? I'd I would like to hear from everybody what you think about this. Um, Simone Levy, please. Okay. I, I think you're muted. Is this right now on? Yes, thank okay. you. First of all, I repeat it. Uh, first of all, congratulations for the Schiller Institute for this extraordinary exercise and uh, an, an opportunity to share and interchange an extremely important information and feedback that uh, uh, we can share for, I mean, different, different people from different nationalities. I would like to make a, a difference of the statements that I will share with you. First of all, I would like to share my, my own experience because this is important 
as a Californian resident. And I later on, later on, please allow me to share my two ways of, uh, of my conclusion. The first, I will make uh, some legal statements because I am a, I am, I am a lawyer. And also I will share like uh, social an analysis uh, on like two or three statements. Uh, first of all, uh, as a Californian resident, uh, I had my ballot since like one month ago when I got from the US, USPS um, uh, the, the ballot, I just uh, see the, the ballot and it was an, extra, an extraordinary easy to go and deliver my, my ballot. They, 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 I went for the, for the uh, local uh, uh, public space and deliver my, my, my ballot. It was an extraordinary easy. In Mexico, we had a, an authority, a, a national authority, with a different uh, measures to check first if the person is the one who is uh, who is uh, who is voting. And I mean, different legal measures. In California, uh, it was uh, extraordinary easy to to release the the ballot, even if if uh, if, if was signed or not. So I don't know if this is like a, like a bad situation or different or but I, I, I believe that the American system is self based on on the confidence of the of the of the voters. And it was like a, try to be like an extraordinary example for the world. But uh, bring me my my own experience, bring me like different uh, uh, feedback. And uh, I didn't understand quite well how it was so easy to vote and deliver my, my ballot. Saying that, uh, I just want to say uh, regarding a, a, a message or the feedback of Daniel Marmolejo. Of course, we had in Mexico a situation with President Lopez Obrador in 2006, but we had a situation of a percentage, a very small percentage, just 0.56% with the different with Felipe Calderon. And of course, we had a lot of evidence that we had a, a very bad situation and, and, uh, and the corruption in different institutions in Mexico. Saying that, I, have, I would like to start with, uh, with my legal statements. First of all, Biden had six million more votes than Trump. He won, or he seems to, 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 he will get 306, 306 electoral college votes. So basically, if we, if we consider that all the, all the recounts on the closest states, I don't think they will change the initial outcome. Uh, so considering this, we have uh, an unprecedented reality in, in US. We have a pandemic situation that of course affects the way and the sources and the sources that all the American voters deliver the, the ballots. Second, there is an extraordinary uh, amount of proof or of evidence that mass media, that different stakeholders affected or conducted the behavior uh, of the American voters. But this is not a, the same that we can call or we can state that there is a significant fraud. So considering that there is an enormous disparity of the, of the pattern that American voters went into the same day to deliver his vote. And there is another pattern of American voters that they send their ballots through the USPS. Uh, considering these and considering all the information that we have uh, heard among the last two hours, I can say and I can state again that there is a dilation, that there is an extraordinary uh, number of uh, irregular uh, proof, uh, evidence, 
and conduction of the of the of the behavior as i said before of the of the voters but there is but this is not the same that we can state or we can label that all the election it was a fraud uh, exercise the third statement is legal the third legal statement is that is extraordinary and i cannot understand this especially in in in, in usa there is no way and they, it's it's extraordinary dangerous that the mass media try to be the authority in in elect in electoral terms so we cannot deliver the confidence of of the institutions and we had we have heard about the importance of the of the mass media but it's extremely dangerous that the electoral college and the electoral authorities in us they they should regulate the the way the power and the behavior of the mass media i think this is not is not a good precedent for us that the mass media they want to interact or they they want to behave as an electoral authority considering these legal statements allow me just to share my insights regarding a uh, social or political analysis as i stated before in my last question i i extremely believe that there is a crisis in the in the all the democracy system in us so i encourage you to to make this kind of uh, exercises to bring more evidence but more, more, most, more the, the, for me, I, I believe will be just the transformation of the mass media because I can bet this, this event or this, 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 this extraordinary example or exercise is not going to be broadcast by the mass media uh, favorite of, uh, of, uh, of America. So this is an example or how we can build a consciousness of the of the critical situation in us second i i believe that mexico on us they need to strengthen the ties uh, not merely with like a personally a relationship like trump with president lopez obrador but more but much moreover to build a common agenda of north america since china is uh, as all of you know uh, china is uh, getting a worldwide strategy with the belt and road uh, 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 initiative of xi jinping so i encourage to the schiller institute or all the stakeholders that they are interested in to interact and create a a, a common agenda much more that that, that surpass the personal relationship between two presidents into an institutional agenda. And finally, uh, I extremely believe that we in the world, we need democracy, but we don't need uh, much more statement that they cannot afford with facts what we are seeking in the in the situation that if we want to 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 prove something we need to have reliable statements reliable reliable arguments and basically uh we need to uh and this is my conclusion we need to 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 separate the committed and relevant uh, proof of fraud and basically evidence of uh, extraordinary and numbers of uh, irregular uh, activities there is no there is no doubt that all the system all the mass media try to conduct the behavior of the voters and basically that's why we need to believe when we we, uh, we need to build much more uh, democracy culture not merely in america but in all over the world thank you very much and congratulations thank you very much thank you very much 
Um, I believe we'll hear next uh, from Juan Francisco Soto, and then we'll finish up with David Meiswinkel. Oh, Marino El Savif is here. I'm sorry, I, I hadn't seen you, I didn't realize. Okay, uh, Juan Francisco <clears throat> Soto next. First of all, I would like to thank the Schiller Institute. It's really an honor to participate uh, with this uh, excellent institution that stands for the greatest principles of the constitutional principles of the United States. And this is what I want to uh, deal with. The answer to this crisis is to be found in the American institutions themselves, which which have spread around the world as a model for democracy around the world. But the US model of democracy has its own rules within the Constitution of the United States, as uh, Jason Ross just uh, expressed so well. Two points I would like to make. First, since the American Constitutional Republic is thank goodness, the Supreme Court of the United States. And to be able to get to the Supreme Court of the United States, we have to go through various instances of courts to go up through the appellate procedure. That is where the deep state has tried to deny the natural rights of the state, uh, such as through the military doctrine, the Lawford case, where you would have a case, well, for example, the case of Lyndon LaRouche himself, who was not exonerated, or or the case of, uh, of uh, or Robert Mueller, who's a questionable personality. You can see his role from the question of Linda LaRouche through the uh, attempted impeachment, the failed impeachment of Donald Trump. You can see a sequence there which culminates in this massive fraud because the proof is enormous. What we don't have are judges. And since you don't have judges and you have a lot of evidence, you have to find answers in the constitution itself. What does the US constitution tell us that the states themselves that are part of the constitution of the United States have a transcendental role, a fundamental role to be able to select the president. So as, uh, as voters and tax payers, we have to demand that all of the legislatures of the United States be opened up where there was fraud based on the blue wave or what was stated at the beginning of his testimony, uh, Mr. Binney, uh, this extremely important uh, intelligence expert and intellectual William Binney, states that cannot uh, validate there were actual administrative procedures, which in in Latin America, we would call these absolutely null processes because they're certifying non-existing votes and they're limiting, limiting the votes of people who voted for Donald Trump. And you can see this in the case of Smartmatic, of Dominion voting machines uh, and channeling votes to Joe Biden. I'd also like to refer to another point, which has always been referred to in uh, law, which is the 14th Amendment. If the United States are going to prohibit and are going to limit the electoral rights of their citizens and their taxpayers, who are after all are the ones who are responsible for uh, paying for these multinational private companies for uh, counting the votes, this can only be done if they respect the appropriate due process, due legal process. If we do not have these in the federal courts, then let us have due process in the legislatures of each and every one of the states where, based on the Constitution of the United States. The preamble says that the states united to establish a more perfect union, to establish justice. So, so these brave fighters such as Leah Hoops and the other people who are exercising their civil rights, who are trying to expand the knowledge among citizens about the Constitution, that all of the legislatures must be opened up to the due process of law of the citizens who th there is plenty of of proof, of evidence. What we don't have are judges. So we do have legislatures. That's all I would like to say. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We'll turn uh, next to David Meiswinkel. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Schiller Institute and I thank all the uh, people that are here. Uh, it's it's quite an honor. I'm holding what uh, the last speaker was just referencing, the, uh, the United States Constitution. Behind me is the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. 
I think that uh, they are quite formidable. And I think they give us all inspiration and strength. And uh, we are all here because uh, they are, are basically at the, uh, we're at the fork in the road, as a New York Yankee catcher used to say, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. <laughs> and so we're, we're there, whether we take the one, one way or the other way. Now, if uh, I've seen uh, the, the presentations, the hearings in Pennsylvania, and uh, as I mentioned before, they were inspirational in the sense of uh, people feeling connected to the Constitution and to their roots, which is very important. And there was uh, important evidence that was being discussed. Uh, when uh, I've read the, uh, the, the Sidney Powell's uh, complaint uh, in Georgia, and uh, she speaks about uh, uh, lots of evidence, uh, all kinds of evidence in reference to the Smartmatic and the Dominion and just to the, uh, the mail-in ballots, how they were counted, et cetera. Uh, I, I think what's important is that uh, we realize that, uh, that uh, well, the, the evidence that we had before us is that it's, it's sense is an impropriety. It's, it's an appearance of impropriety. It's, it says nothing until we get it into a court and we can uh, examine it as evidence. The uh, complaints don't list the attachments, so you can't really go into them. But uh, there seems to be certainly a lot there. If you can overturn uh, the election in just in one state, I think it would have a, a momentous uh, carryover into the other states. What we're looking at here is a systematic, uh, and as, as Mr. Schlanger said, it's really a criminal conspiracy. It seems like, especially in those swing states, uh, it seems to be the same pattern repeating itself over and over and over and over again. Now, if these uh, brave individuals can uh, get this into the courts and, and uh, get it uh, into the public, uh, that would be uh, sensational. What we're seeing too, and I like to look at, at the various contexts in which we exist in. Uh, and again, I, we all bring our own backgrounds into it. Uh, to me, this is really a global assault on the United States, the national sovereignty. We've seen it throughout the world, and there was the Arab Springs. They're trying to repeat it in this country. It seems that way, and there's a pushback now. And we've seen it in Pennsylvania, other states. There's a pushback. People are going back to their roots, uh, and that roots, again, is going back to the Constitution, the Founding Fathers, and what this, this society was built on. We were built on overcoming and throwing out oppression, and at that time, we were ruled by the, the British Empire. So uh, I guess to, to uh, sum it up is that uh, there's a lot of evidence or a lot of appearance that a fraud, for, 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 without a doubt. As I said, the appearance of impropriety throughout all the states that were questionable. And it seems to be a pattern. It has to be investigated. It may take a while. Uh, we've not gone down this path before, so we don't know what to expect. Uh, there are both, uh, there's both sides drawn. We probably all know people, good friends of ours that are basically taking another position. I think that when the media is examined, we'll find, as, as Harvey Schlanger said, it is, it's, it's a very a biased media, very, uh, it's almost a weaponized media. It's weaponized to undermine the fabric of America, unfortunately. So by, uh, by stretching this out a bit, it, it, it draws the lines for all of us to see. So people that were never activated at one time or involved, they will tend now to become more sensitized. So in order to keep a republic, people have to be educated and they have to be vigilant. And because of these uh, different uh, hearings and because people in the states are, are coming to the forefront, uh, they're going to make other people vigilant. So again, thank you for conducting this uh, program and thank you for inviting me to be on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we'll conclude with the, uh, the dean of our body of jurists, Marino el Saviv. Would you like to say anything in conclusion about the event today? 
Muchísimas gracias por la Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you here today. People are so courageous and so qualified. I, you've honored me by uh, allowing me to be here with you for the Schiller Institute especially and, and my friend, my brother, Dennis Small and Gabriela uh, Ramirez, I want to recall them as well for all the work, years we've worked together. This opportunity that the United States has in this crisis, this crisis that is so deep, is also an opportunity to move forward. And this is uh, here we see the teachings of Linda LaRouche expressed with regard to the manifest destiny of the United States. But I would like to address this from the standpoint of in the following manner. We have to preserve the law governing electoral rights and the role of the Constitution in the electoral process. We have to preserve the institutions of the United States and we have to tell the world that the democratic institutions of the country, which is uh, given the best indications through their American system of po growth of the population, of the dignity of man, of the feeling of equality and that all human beings, we are all equal before the creator, before our Lord Jesus Christ, that that real conviction of agape, which Linda LaRouche spoke about, that uh, cognitive power that we human beings have to transform the world, that this be elicited and operate in the United States to be able to move forward democratically and preserving the institutions. The legal battle that the lawyers have before them uh, clearly is addressing a certain principle, and that is that fraud corrupts everything. And if there was an electoral blackout, if the voting machines of Smartmatic and Dominion committed a fraud in the US elections, they must be sanctioned by law. If methods were used of uh, fractioning metrics and that can be proven before a court of law, there have to be consequences because these are contrary to the democratic spirit of the founding fathers of the United States. As, as Lyndon LaRouche himself said when he spoke about the beginnings of North American society, of the U.S. society, he, in, 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 two, in the year 2000, and I have here something from Linda LaRouche about what he called the manifest destiny of the United States, the emergence in New England in 1630 through John Winthrop and the birth of that society, that North American society, which got rid of the imperialist criteria and rather understood that all human beings are created equal in the image and likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know that to speak about God at this time in a pagan society, in a, in a fractured society and in a, in a society which had been induced by the media towards uh, libertinism and sensuality. I know that this is odious to the ears of many people, but thinking only of the manifest destiny of the United States, can we confront this American autumn, which has a true parallel with, with what uh, the Arab Spring was and is, which has created destruction, it has created death, it has created wars, and above all, it, it has brought us to the very edge of a thermonuclear war which would end humanity, and we would return to a medievalism, to a dark age, as Linda LaRouche always warned us about. Hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That concludes the witnesses and the 
responses from our legal experts, I'd like to say a few things in closing in terms of what the next steps are um, that you can take as a person and uh, as a what the Schiller Institute is doing in the future. So I do want to repeat what Harley had said about the conference that we have coming up in two weeks. On December 12th and 13th, that's uh, two weekends from this one, the Schiller Institute will have a two-day conference where we're going to be taking up what it takes to have a society in which people are able to knowledgeably deliberate about their common future, um, to create economic growth, to develop new scientific principles, and to solve the challenges, the urgent challenges confronting the world. If you note the date, this is just before the electoral college votes are to be cast, at least as they're scheduled to be cast, uh, on December 14th. The conference will include a report back on this event, as well as obviously the, you know, what, whatever developments we will see to have occurred um, by that time. The topics include the digital dictatorship potential versus having a true republic. Um, that is in terms of electoral fraud potentials, in terms of financial control versus sovereign nation states that we are actually able to control the governments of. We're going to talk about the economy and how to create the leaps in economy that will allow us to dramatically improve living conditions, eliminate poverty worldwide, and why going green is not the way to do that. We're going to talk about how science advances through the resolution of what appear to be opposites by the creation of a higher principle, a, a better understanding, in which the seemingly contradictory approaches of the past are seen to be failed and subsumed by something higher. This will be applied to ch taking on such challenges as COVID, as hunger, um, as poverty in the world. Also, this is the 250th anniversary of the year of Beethoven's birth. And we're going to be having a panel on culture, creativity. This will include presentations from some of the uh, younger members of the Schiller Institute on Shakespeare and on the differences between the American and French revolutions. So in terms of, I encourage everybody to register for that. You can see the link here on the side uh, and also in the video description uh, below on YouTube. So in terms of the, the outcome of this, this hearing that we had today, uh, we've heard all manner of testimony about the context in which this election took place, a context involving threats of a military coup, of years of lies about Russiagate creating a climate of hostility against the results of the last election, of the 2016 election. And we got some idea of the, the broader world context that all of this occurs in. So the opportunity to have faith in our electoral process, to understand that an outcome of election is something that we can trust and accept, even if it doesn't go the way that we want, well, that demands transparency. And we've heard so many ways that that transparency simply has not existed. It was made impossible, and the potentials for fraud uh, engendered by that. So the moves afoot in terms of legal suits. Uh, I encourage everybody, read the filings. If you want to, to see, you know, if you say, well, where is the evidence? There's plenty of it. You can go ahead and read those Georgia and Michigan filings, uh, unless Facebook or Twitter have blocked links to them again. You can see the affidavits, the evidence that's been submitted with them. You can have a look at it yourself. If you live in Pennsylvania, Arizona, Michigan, for example, you can get in touch with your state legislators and urge them to consider whether it's appropriate for them to use their legislative power uh, to redefine the appointment of electors in this election. So really, who benefits from having such non-transparent elections? What would be the goal uh, in creating a system where here we are 50 years after putting man on the moon and we can't run an election um, that offers results that can be accepted and trusted and believed um, by so many people in the United States. So I encourage you personally to investigate this, look through the evidence, and take appropriate actions based on what you uh, come to discover. And that's certainly what we will be doing. So with that, I'd like to draw this event to a close. I'd like to thank everybody who participated, our witnesses, our questioners, our 
legal experts on our, our, ju on our uh, ju panel of jurists, and uh, I will hopefully be seeing you and the many people that you bring along to our conference in two weeks from now. Thank you, and we'll see you later.